passed away, one of his students began his hesped with a Pasuk in Yecheskel. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Yecheskel to inform the people about the impending destruction of the Beis Amigdash. But he did not tell Yecheskel to say the word, the Beis Amigdash is going to be destroyed. Instead, Yecheskel was told to stand in front of the people and to let out a very bitter sigh. And when the people would see that, they would understand. They would know that there's terrible news that would cause everyone's hearts to melt and everyone's hands to become weak. The students said, we see from here that there are no words that can adequately describe the enormous tragedy of the Chuban Abayas. Similarly, said the student with regard to his Rebbe, the Briskarov, cannot adequately describe the feelings of the loss that we have. In our case, in our generation, in our time, unfortunately, we also cannot feel the loss, the enormous loss of the Beis Amigdash. But it's not because it's something that we experience. And the loss is so enormous that we can't put it into words. Words would limit the feelings of our loss. It's just the opposite, to the contrary. Unfortunately, we've never seen the tremendous nisim, the tremendous miracles that occurred, that existed in the Beis Amigdash. Just like if you would try to describe to an 18th century person, he couldn't yearn for electric light bulbs or for air conditioning on a very hot, sultry summer's day. It's not something that they experience. They cannot comprehend. And therefore, in our case, the base of Mignosh, no one has ever seen the Nisim. No one ever heard the Abishta's name emerge from the lips of the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur. No eyes experienced when Klai Yisrael prostrated to the ground and all together as one said, Baruch Shem Kavod Mahusar Le'ilam Bo'ed. We cannot fathom what it means that the Abishta is not with us, meaning that the presence of the Shechina is not here with us. It's not something that's revealed for everybody to see. So the question is, we have to be able to rebuild the base of Midas. How do we do that? If we cannot feel the presence of the Abishta, if the Abishta's presence is hidden in nature, in material things, in the way the world, the normal operations of the world, how do we, how can we actually feel the loss? How can we feel that the Abish's presence is here to be able to connect and to rebuild the base of English? Truth is that when the base of English was standing, the feeling of the Abish's presence was so significant. It was so vivid. It was so real. It was so clear that it inspired when people would go to Yushalayim Mirak They would feel the Abish's presence and they would want to do tshuva for Averis that they may have done. That's how vivid, that's how real the tangible feeling of the Abish's presence was in the world. And now, unfortunately, with the destruction of the Beis Migdash, our awareness and our relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu has suffered. It's weakened. The Abish's presence is very hidden from us. It's hidden in nature. We cannot connect to him. Our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu is shrouded in the confusing events of the physical world, of the material world, and of the natural phenomena. And despite the fact that there's so much learning, Baruch Hashem, in today's generation, in today's day, and there's so much chesed, Baruch Hashem, going on, we still suffer because we cannot connect. We have difficulty connecting with the Yavish's presence as it was so vivid in the time when the Beis Amigdash stood. A recent article written in December of 2022 by Rabbi Shimon Russell, who's an LCSW. And he said, based on his actual experience treating people, there's a new phenomenon, he describes it. In Eretz Yisrael, he said it exists in Lakewood, it exists in Brooklyn and in other places. And he talks about the mostly 60% of today's students. They are the students in the middle. They're not the ones excelling. They're in the middle. And therefore, they're still from. They still keep Shabbos. They don't do tattoos, he writes in his article. And they aren't angry or rebellious. But the problem is that there's no passion. There's no sense of mission or purpose in their spirituality and their ruchnius. In fact, he's calling the phrase, he's called them on the derech, but uninspired Jews. So we, we suffer the fact that we do not see the vivid presence of the Abish's Shechina. 
So the question is, how do we recapture that? And in order to build the base of Migush, it's something that we're going to have to experience. How are we able to do that? How can we rebuild the base of Migush if it's something that we do not feel? So I'd like to share with you an idea, a thought. And the thought is about when Shloim HaMelech built the base of Migdosh, he obviously is the one who built it. But in several places, you find that Dovod HaMelech is associated with the building of the base of Migdosh. And the question is, how could that be? Shloim HaMelech is the one that built it, not Dovod HaMelech. The Gemara in Zavachim, Davchob Dalin, asked the question. The Gemara asked, when Dovod HaMelech was Magdish, he sanctified the base of Migdosh. Was he Magdish? Did he sanctify only the tiles of the base of Migdosh, the floor? Or was he Magdish, the base of Migdosh, all through the ground of the place where the base of Migdosh stood? And that's a very puzzling question that the Gemara asked, because as I just mentioned, Shloim HaMelech is the one that built the base of Migdosh, not Dover HaMelech. So what's the Gemara's question? When Dover HaMelech was Magdish, he's not the one that built the base of Migdosh. And that's Toysus' question. Toysus answers that it's true. Shloim HaMelech built the physicality, the chitzonius of the base of English. But Dovod HaMelech instilled the Kedusha. What does that mean? So I once heard from Rabbi Yisrael Reisman the following explanation. There are two parts to the base of Migdash. There's the physical part, the stones, the beams, the curtains, the tiles of the base of Migdash. That's the chitzonius the outer part of the base of Migdash. And then there's a second part. The second part of the base of Migdash is the premius, the essence, the Kedusha, that's the devotion, the longing, the Tzipisili Yeshua. Did you long for the return of the Geula of the base of Migdash? You find a similar concept, Be'ez HaShem, when the third base of Migdash will be rebuilt. In one place, it's mashma, it seems, that will come in Ashamayim. In the other place, it appears that we have to build it. That's a contradiction. Do we build it? Or is it something that comes from heaven? And the answer is, I believe, with the same Yisrael, that the Pneumius will come in Ashamayim. The Kedusha will come down. Yes, we will build the Chitzonius. We will build the outer whatever is necessary to rebuild the stones and the building of the base of Migdash. But the primius, the essence, the lay, the heart, the desire, the longing, the yearning, the connection that we have with the Shechina, that will be something, the Shechina will be brought down in the Shemaya. In our day and age, we also can connect with the primius of the Shechina, if you will, we can do that by connecting with the concept of Ashkocha Proteus. We find in Eicha, the last Pasuk is, Hashivenu Hashem, Eilachom and Oshuva, Chadeshimenu Kikedem. We're asking the Eivishter that we should do Tshuva and we should connect, we should be inspired of an Oshuva and return to him. Chadeshimenu Kikedem. Like it was all the way in the beginning when the Eivishter's presence was vivid, was real, was literally almost tangible. If we go back to another time in Jewish history where we also had to do tshuva, you know when that was? I'm referring to the time of Purim. In the time of Purim, the Gemara says something that is very astonishing. You know what enabled Klal Yisrael? You know what inspired Klal Yisrael to do tshuva at the time of the story of Purim? It was not the fact that all the Nevi'im had prophesied destruction if we didn't do tshuva. The Nevi'im, or the Nevi'ais, no, that is the Gemara. The Gemara said when Ahasuerus removed his ring, the ring with the signet, that if he would have sealed the document, then Haman, Harasha, would have been able to start to destroy Klal Yisrael. When Klal Yisrael saw that, then they did tshuva. So the obvious question is, the Nevi'im, they were believed totally and completely. Everybody knew that what the Nevi'im said was with Ruach HaKodesh. And yet Klal Yisrael was not inspired to do tshuva based on what they heard from the Nevi'im. There was no doubt that it was true. 
but yet they weren't inspired, they weren't moved to go to the next level of Kedusha, of Ruchnius, and to connect and to do tshuva. When were they able? When were they inspired? When they experienced Achashverosh removing that ring from his finger, about to seal the letter and to seal the fate of the Jewish people. That's when they realize, you know something? We need to change course. We need to do something different. And therefore they did tshuva and Baruch Hashem, we know the rest of the story. It's true, we don't have the nisim that existed during the base of Migdash when it was here, when Klal Yisrael Jews would go to Yishalayim and Rakhidosh and they were so taken, so inspired. They were in awe of the Nisim that they heard, that they saw, that they experienced. And they wanted to do tshuva for any Averis that they have. We do not have that. We are not Zeicher to be able to see, to witness the Nisim. But we can, and we are Zeicher, to experience out of ordinary situations that we can see the Abish's presence you know, when things happen run of the mill, the usual, then we chalk it up to the usual. It's nature. We we lose sight of the Abish's presence. We know intellectually, theoretically, with our seicha, we know that the Abish runs the world. But that's not enough. Your data hayoin voise elevovecho. For a thought to get someone to change his behavior for the better. It must be something that is alavavecha. When we experience the out of ordinary hashkocha protis, that's the first step in starting to reconnect with the Abishka's hashkocha protis and his presence. To start to get closer in our relationship, to be able to go beyond just doing mitzvahs, mitzvahs anoshim alamada, doing it by rote. It's a mitzvah, true, but there's so much more we are able to do. And if we want to be able to rebuild the base of Migdash, we have to be able to connect, to be able to feel what it means that the Abishta is present in our world. And again, we cannot feel the Nisim, we're not Zoyacha to that. But the mile of the Nisim, the advantage of the Nisim was it was out of the ordinary. It's almost like it's the well moment. Something happens and you stop that in your tracks and you go, wow, wow, did you see that? We can have a glimpse into that experience. We can feel it to the degree that it's possible. And it is very possible. That so-called wow moment as well, when we experience out of the ordinary situations. So I'd like to share two suggestions by Gedolim throughout the recent, let's call it 70, 80 years as to how we can connect with this idea of connecting with the Abish's presence is Ashkocha Proteus. And again, if we can connect with the natural phenomena, we get up every morning and we say the brachas in the morning and we have food to eat and all those wonderful chasodim that we are able to experience, but unfortunately gets lost in the natural running of the day. But if we can connect with Ashkocha Pratis, Mama, she can literally see the Yad Hashem. You stop that in your tracks and you say, wow, did you see that? May not be an S, but it's definitely out of the ordinary. It can move us. It can inspire us to say that was Yad Hashem. There were so many stories. I'd like to share a few of them with you. The first one is about a man who goes to a kosher food expo. And he's got coffee beans that he wants to show. He wants to be able to portray. He wants, that's his panosa. He goes to the kosher food expo and literally nobody signs up to be a customer of his. Very deflating feeling. He's wasted time, money, effort. I didn't get anywhere. So he goes in his car and he heads home. And he's going in New York City on the FDR Drive. A very heavily traveled highway. And he looks for the nearest gas station because he realizes he's low on fuel in his car. And when he looks away for that moment, the car in front of him slows down and he, unfortunately, crashes into that car. Baruch Hashem, nobody is hurt, walks out of the car. It's a luxury car. 
And the woman driving in the car in front of him comes out and says, you see what you did? He said, yeah, I'm sorry, it's my fault, no problem, we'll call the insurance companies. Let's just give it a couple of minutes until the cops come. So the woman says to him, listen, you know, you were going rather fast. He said, I know, my, my mind wasn't in it. And I, I just came from a kosher food expo and I, I, it was, I didn't get anywhere. I didn't make any business. I feel so deflated. And she happens to say to him, I happen to be a representative of several very large supermarkets. Would you like to show me what your product looks like? Not believing like what's happening, he goes to the trunk of his car and he takes out the products. He shows her the coffee beans. She likes it so much and she says, you know what? I'd like to buy these as representative of the big supermarkets that I represent. It's flabbergasted. He goes to the food expo and nothing. This is a wild, out of the ordinary experience. It's not an S. Accidents do happen. People do speak after crashing one car into the other, but it's out of the ordinary. It's not your usual occurrence. And what are the odds that the person that you happen to crash into happens to be someone that can help you out in your panosa? They make up to meet in her office the next day. He goes down there, they sign a contract. Bar Hashem. What a wonderful Hashkocha Pratis moment. We can't say, no, that's nature. It happens. You know what I mean? It happens on its own, by itself. It's a coincidence. This is the Abish, this Yad Mamish working to get him his panosa. Another story. Rabbi Yosef Yosel Horowitz, the future Alta of Navardic, becomes engaged at the age of 18. Now, he wanted to learn, but unfortunately, his future father-in-law is Nifter. And he's left now to see to it that there's panosa for his mother-in-law, her eight children, and his wife. So he has to go to work. At the age of 27, he takes a trip to the town of Rabbi Sur Salanta. He goes to Memel on a business trip. He, together with hundreds of people, are descending from the car, from the railroad car. And at the other end of the station, there's Rabbi Sur Salanta standing there. You saw Salanta's eyes start to focus on this individual running. He has a reddish beard. And he's running with his weirs under his arms. Where we saw Salanta goes over to him and says, where are you running, young man? So the young man tells Rabbi Saul Salanta, I'm running to make a panosa. And he tells him what happened. I'm the one who's Achroi. I'm responsible for my mother-in-law, for my wife, and for the eight children. I have to make a panosa. So we saw Salanta looks at him and says, it's true, you have to make a panosa. You have to tend to your needs. You're right. But you have greater needs after 120 years of a last for eternity. In Olam Haba, you will be there. You will be living there longer than you will be living here. And therefore, what about those needs? Those stark words pierced Rabbi Yosef Yosel's heart literally to the core. And he resolved at that time to attend Rabbi Shoh Salanta's Shmuzin on Mesilat Sisharim in the great synagogue in Memel. And after listening to 13 Shmuzin, 13 lectures, Rabbi Yosef Yosel made a momentous decision that affected thousands in Klal Yisrael. He closed his business. He put aside a certain significant amount of money towards his family needs. And he joined Rabbi Shoh Salanta's Koilo learning literally 18 hours a day. From that, he became the Alton of Nevadic, who literally positively affected thousands upon thousands. Can you imagine Nashkocha Pratis? Where we saw Salanta happens to be at the rail station at the same time that the train happens, then he happens to focus on one individual. Another story. The future Hassam Seifer, Moshe Seifer, is eager to get married. So they look into a certain young lady 
and he would like to get engaged to her. She's a very fine character. And he also figures out he'll be able to continue learning Torah. And he becomes a husband. His mother is not for the Shidduch. The mother finds out that there are certain facts that they were unaware of. Number one, she's a widow. Number two, she was older than her son, Moshe, the future Hassam Saifa. And she didn't want it. Not only that, some Saifa's Rabbeim, Rabbi Adler and the Hafla, two of Moshe's Saifa's Rabbeim were also against it for other reasons. He writes a letter to Rabbi Adler. And he waits and he waits and he waits for the response. Doesn't get a response. He's confused. He's uncertain. What should he do? He goes ahead with the Shaddach. Right after the Hasana, he receives a return letter from his Rebbe urging him to terminate the Shaddach. But the future Hassam Saifa saw the Hashkocha Protis. He was already married. And the fact that the letter came too late was a sim and a sign to him that what he did is something that he had to do. Another story. Hashmuel Greinerman once traveled with the Chavetz Chaim to collect money for the Radin Yeshiva. And they went to a wealthy individual who was going to give a lot of money and they decided to stay a little bit longer to count the money. And by doing so, they got to the train station a little bit late and they had to wait. They missed their train back to Radin and they had to wait four hours. What do we do? Reb Greinerman asked the Chavetz Chaim. Chavetz Chaim said, don't worry. With the Abish's help, it'll be fine. Sure enough, 10 minutes later, here comes the train. The train comes back. The train that left, which they missed, comes back. Why? So they asked the conductor. The conductor said there was a juncture where I was supposed to go left. And for some strange, inexplicable reason, the train went right. So I had to turn around and come back. Rav Greinem and Esther Chavetz Chaim, is this considered to be a Ness, a miracle? The Chavetz Chaim says no. When a Jew does things lishma for the sake of heaven, without any personal motives, he is guaranteed that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will arrange all the possible circumstances for his benefit, even if it means getting a train to come back. These are some of the, let's call it vivid situations of the Abish HaShkoch protis. And when we see them, it registers at the time, wow, that's Yad Hashem, wow, the train comes back. The guy who's in the accident now has his panosa. Sam Seifer marries the Kala. And then it turns out the Rebbe said, no, but he was already married. These are situations that are beyond comprehension. They're not Nisim, but they are beyond the usual day-to-day -day phenomena. And therefore, we can more clearly connect with the presence of the Yavishter. The fact that the Yara Sandash Kachapratis means that the Yavishter runs the world and one can connect and say, wow, I'm going to elevate my Ruchnius. When we clearly see the Yad Hashem, then that inspires us. But the problem is when these moments occur, at the moment, we might connect. But then we lose sight of it. So I'd like to share with you another idea. In 1984, Ramosha Feinstein Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky both wrote the following. They advocated that a person should keep a personal journal to document instances of Hashkoch Pratis in their life. <coughs> and by doing so, they'll be able to go back and to reread it and to live it and to experience it once again. And they weren't the only ones who made the suggestion. Rav Chatzko Levenstein would suggest to his young daughters, in fact, he would incentivize them. He would give them an incentive. Keep a personal journal. Whenever something happens that you recognize, where you experience, where you are witness to Yad Hashem, write it down. Keep track of it. And you know what will happen? So I'm old enough to remember the following. You may not be. I remember when Polaroid camera came out. You can open, take a picture. You remember cameras? I don't know if we have that nowadays anymore. You take a camera, you take a picture, you open up the back, and the film would be there. They called it the 60-second LAN Polaroid LAN camera. 
and you would leave it there for 60 seconds. And you know what would happen during those 60 seconds? The picture would develop. A little piece, a little dot, another dot, and after a while, all the dots converge and you have a very clear picture. This is that idea. Write a personal journal of the situations where you experience Yad Hashem. By doing so, it'll become one, two, three stories, four stories. They don't have to be long. They don't have to be miracles. Just something out of the ordinary. You happen to have met someone. That's an example of Yad Hashem, extraordinary situations. Keep track of that. You will start to be connected with the presence of the Abishta on a day-to-day -day basis. You'll be able to accomplish to a limited degree, but it's a start to be able to see Yad Hashem similar to what Klal Yeshua was able to see when they went up to Yishalayim when the base of Midrash was standing because it was Nisim. And it was the feeling of everyone together, we can do something very similar. And I will say, but it's not going to be enough. How can we build the base of Midrash with experiences like that, even as only the start, the foundation, the beginning, of connecting, of being aware of the Yad Hashem. So you know something? People make a mistake. Our job is not to accomplish. Our job is to do. To the famous story with the Mikhtar Melio Rab Desla. In 1939, the summer of 39, Rab Desla's wife and daughter goes to Lithuania to visit the family. And we know what happened. Nebuch, World War II broke out. Rab Desla was unable to be to see his wife and daughter for six years. And he wondered, why is the Abish they're doing this? Why am I able to be alive and but separated from them? And two years later, in 1941, Rab Desla gets a letter. His letter is from Rab Dov Dry in the Shoichit, the Shoichit of Gateshead. And he has a novel idea. The letter says, I'd like to start a koilel. Huh? A koilel? During World War II? In England, where there are bombs falling? The letter was sent to 22 Rabbanim. 18 of them did not respond. Three of them responded, very nice idea, I'd love to do it, but hey, you know, there's a war going on. Rab Desla is the only one that responds Thank you so much for thinking of me. When do we begin? Baruch Hashem, we can make a curler. Rab Desla did not think it would succeed. That's not the reason why he wanted to participate. Rab Desla would later say that, and he would frequently quote his great-grandfather, Rabbi Yisrael Salante, and here's what he would say. Medapnish oifton. Medapnish Opton, medapnish nochton. Basically, what that means in English is our job is not to accomplish. Our job is to do. Our job is not to be among the naysayers and say, well, so what am I going to I'm going to keep a journal, Mashiach of How's that going to build a base of English? Each individual has their ability to do what their achrayas, what their responsibility. We need to do, imagine if somebody says, we want to build something, it'll be beautiful. And everybody say, yes, I want to pitch in. Can you imagine if I told you the base of me, the Chanel, that's right, today it's outside. And they need people to contribute. We would run. I want to give this, I want to have a yard in the base of me. No, I want to have a yard. Well, guess what? We can have a yard as well now. But you'll ask, will that actually be the building of the base of Igdash? But I mentioned before the Toysfis. There are two parts to the base of Igdash. There is the stones, the curtains, the tiles. That's not our job. It's true when we'll be Zayche, then Klal Yisrael will build it. But as individuals, as individuals, part of the collective Klai Israel, our job, each individual responsibility, like Rab Desla said, why he participated in the Koilel in the time of war, 
He did not join the naysayers. He said, yes, I'm going to do what I can do. Quoting his great grandfather, the Heiliger of Yisrael Salante, because our job is not to accomplish. That's the Avista's job. Our job is to do. I want to leave you with one last point. If you think that we cannot literally do and even accomplish, we're making a mistake. Rav Tzadok HaKoyin says in Sitkis HaTzadik, Ois Nun Beis, he said, Doiroi Shel Mashiach, Vada Yehovah will be beloved, V'yefsha Shiyakulai Chayim. It could be because the Gemara said that the Gula will come but during a generation. Shekulei Zakai, they're wrong, they're worthy. Or B'dor Shekulei Chayev, were they not worthy? So even, even if the generation is Kulei Chayev, said Rab Tzodik, the Eberster will bring them to Tshuva. And therefore, once that happens, Shoyrish Nishmosam, the root of the Nishamas, will be me Makam Gavaya. From the highest place, Yosem Mikola Doirais. Can you imagine? We do our part and we build the Pneumius. We start to connect with the Abish's presence. It's true, we don't have Nisim. We don't, we're not Zoyah to miracles. And it's true, the other end of the spectrum, the typical day to day situations are difficult to connect to see the Abish's presence. He's hiding the Shekhinah in Begalusa in Golos. But we can connect with the out of the ordinary wow moments. And we can keep a journal of that. And similar to what happened in the Ness of Purim, where Klau Yisrael did tshuva because they were inspired when they saw King Ahasuerus about to sign the letter, the decree to annihilate Chatzasholom Klau Yisrael. We can experience our own experiences. Why do we have to have Melech Koshik Ahomon, a difficult king that will push us to do tshuva out of fear? Let's elevate ourselves. Let's inspire ourselves to be connected with the Avish's presence with these out of ordinary experiences that each one of us, that's right, you're driving in the car, you met someone, you heard something. All these are Yad Hashem. Be'ez Hashem. If we will keep a journal so we do not lose sight of the moments and we start to connect the dots like the old Polaroid land camera, we can make a beautiful picture. When the dots connect, it'll be the picture of the Yad Hashem, of the Yavish's presence. It'll be as close as we can to experience the Nisim that they had in the Big Dush. And in that source, it will elevate a level of emuna to an emuna chushis, something that we feel the ultimate, says Rabbi Yerucham Lovav, is the ultimate emuna. And that's chus. And with the fact that the Edis Hashem, hopefully, we will be the door, as Rav Tzodik says, on the Shomad, comes from the highest place, we will be able to be Zoycha, to bring the Geula, to do the Tshuva, to connect with the Ebishra as much as is necessary. And then they will say about our generation, that generation, they were the ones that were Zaycha to build, to rebuild the base of English. Thank you for Here is a profound and moving idea from our tradition about Tisha B'Av. On Tisha B'Av, we commemorate the Churban Beis Hamikdash, the destruction of the Temple and Jewish sovereignty. Incredible devastation. So, if we want to know how to deal with Churban a little bit, a very good way to do it is to go back into Jewish history and find when is the first time destruction Churban articulated. And how do we respond to it? The first time this concept comes up is when God first created the world. The Medrash says 
that it's not simply that God said, let there be, and God said that there should be a beautiful world, and a beautiful world emerged. No, it happened differently. Says the Medrash and Bereshis Rabbah, it's also quoted in Gemara, that God built a world, but the world wasn't good enough. So Machrivan was destroyed. Churban built another world, wasn't good enough. Destroyed again and again and again. Finally, a beautiful world emerged. Hashem saw a beautiful world. It was a good world. Said, oh, this is a good world. So this medrash is very audacious. What are the sages, our Chachamim, trying to tell us that Hashem built, but it, it didn't come out good enough. It failed, so we needed to do many tries. When it comes to human beings and human invention, because we are limited and fallible, so the road to discovery is littered with trial and error, with with destruction, with bad models, bad prototypes. You have to Iterate again and again. In Silicon Valley, they say we pivot. <laughs> Something you build it, it's not good, so you need to build again. What does it mean that God couldn't get it right? What, what's the pshat? What's the meaning? So in the Medrash and in other places, also based on the Rambam and Hilchus Deus, the answer is very beautiful. Of course God could have built the world the first time perfectly, no question. But because... A human being is called on Lehidamis Lakel to model our behavior on God, to act like God, to behave like God. So God did not want to create a world perfect the first time, and that should be the model. Because in our world, that's never what happens. In our life, we build and we fail. We work hard to build our own life, our character, our marriage. And then things fall apart. In real life, there's a churban. You're bayna ilam, you work hard to create something, and then it falls apart. So it could be a person who's going to work hard to build. It could be a business. It could be something spiritual. And then destruction happens. Mistakes are made. Bad things happen. And then the person is full of despair. He says, look, such a catastrophe happened, and, and, and I'm guilty. I can't recover from this. This is going to define me. I'm trapped in the Chorban for the rest of my life. My wrong, my addiction, my problem is going to define me. So what Hashem wants every human being to know is that when you build in life, when you work hard to do something what is good, right, just, Kedusha, Teira, Mitzvah, Teira, and then there's destruction, don't give up. Learn from Hashem. Does Hashem give up? No. After a Chorban. So if you work hard in life, you want to have a certain kedusha in your life, you want to have something beautiful and there's this failure, don't give up. Wake up the next morning and say, I'm going to, after the churban, I'm going to be bayin the ilam again, I'm going to build again, I'm going to create something new again. That's very powerful. That's very realistic. So yes, there's a moment of tragedy. Yes, there's a singular day of Tisha B'Av where we reflect on what went wrong. But the primary thrust of Yiddishkeit and of Teirah and Mitzvah is to focus on how do we rebuild after the Churban. That's what Hashem teaches us. That after the Churban you have Bein Eil. And in fact, all of Yiddishkeit, all of Jewish history is built on courageous daily Yisrael, courageous Jewish leaders, and also individuals who after tremendous devastation didn't surrender to defeat, but they had the courage like a lion to get up the next morning and to rebuild. And there's a beautiful example in the Gemara. The Gemara in um, Yavamis, I think it's around Daf Samach, tells us a very powerful story of Rabbi Akiva. Some of the story is known, but some of the details are not known, not so famous. Rabbi Akiva, the great influential mind of the second century who molded so much of Yiddishkeit, Jewish thought and practice. He not only was, indiv was he individually so great, but he also raised and educated 24,000 Talmidi Rabbi Akiva disciples who were extraordinary people. And these were all the leaders of the next generation, 24,000. We all know to educate one child properly is very, very hard. 
So imagine the sleepless nights of Rabbi Akiva to educate to your Mechanech 24,000 Talmidim that the Gemara should say about them that they are Talmidim Rabbi Akiva. So imagine their, their Teira, their Lomdus, their Yerushamayim, their Kedusha, their Tahara. Unbelievable. 24,000. And then suddenly tragedy struck and they all died. All 24. Rabbi Akiva's whole life's work up in smoke. Khurban. Could you imagine? God forbid, imagine a loss of one child. 24,000 Talmidim that he loved, that he worked for for decades, all gone. And Rabbi the Gemara says, Rabbi Akiva, he wasn't 20, he wasn't 30, he wasn't 40, he wasn't 50. You know how old he was? He was 80 years old when that event happened. Imagine the destruction that was. In fact, the Gemara says, in describing this situation, the whole Jewish world was devastated. There was no future. It was a destroyed world. Rabbi Akiva woke up the next morning, the Gemara says, and he started to walk through all of Eretz Yisrael, searching for little bachrim, little new students, who we can raise and teach them Torah and Yiddishkeit in a way that they will be able to carry the burden, which was very difficult, of the Jewish people and raise the next generation. And it says he found five young disciples, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yesi, Rabbi Nechemia, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, five. And he educated them. And with these five Talmidim, he rebuilt all of Jewish history. If you look into the Medrash, if you look into Tisefta, Sifri, Mishnah, you can't turn a page without bumping in to some of these Talmidim. In fact, all of Halacha basically follows Rab Meir. Because that, the majority of Mishnas, the author is Rab Meir. That's one of the disciples. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai is the author of the Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical tradition. So you have two of these Talmidim, one with the leader, the leadership role in terms of Jewish legal thought, the Mishnah, and one Kabbalah, Jewish mystical thought. So here you have Rabbi Akiva, who at the age of 80 years old, everything went bankrupt, destroyed Chorban, but he understood that he's not going to be defined by that, even though his whole life's work went up in smoke. But to be a Jew is to wake up and to lidam islokel, to say, I'm going to be God-like. I'm going to have superhuman strength. I'm going to look forward to the future, and I'm going to change the future. How does a human being do that? When big tragedy happens, how do you? Because, you see, a human being could do two things. A human being could look back at the past and, sit and, and, and kvetch about it and feel sad about the past and ask, why did this happen to me? And always define yourself by the past. But a human being has a unique capacity because they have a neshama to look into the future, not the past. The past you can't change. But to look into the future and say, not why did this happen to me, but now that this, this did happen to me, what am I going to do differently? What am I going to change in the future to build a different future? So you can look back at the past, at a tragedy, at an addiction, at a sin, at a mistake, at a destruction, and always look backwards, or you could say, I'm an architect of a new future, I'm going to build a new world now based on the mistakes, I'm going to learn from them, I'm going to build something new and powerful. You could look, many in America today look at themselves as a football. They're an object. They're an object that get, gets kicked around by fate or genetics or environment or the yeshiva. It's different people's fault. I'm a football, I'm being kicked around and I'm a victim. <laughs> Rabbi Akiva looks at it differently. He's not a football, he's a quarterback, so to speak. A quarterback doesn't say, yeah. A quarterback says, the ball's in my hand. I'm going to, I have a goal, a goal goes, and now I'm going to move a whole team. I'm going to move to victory because I choose where to move and how to, how to develop a victory. So that's what a human being has, the capacity to say, I'm a quarterback. I could determine the future because after destruction, I could be Baina Ilumis, I could rebuild beautiful worlds. And whatever mistake I did, no matter what type of devastation I come from, the Jewish people as a nation, as Kal Yisrael, and a Jew individually, like Rabbi Akiva, has the capacity to say, tomorrow is going to be something special and beautiful. There was a... a it was a, a community back in Russia, Ukraine, where there were many, many Hasidim, it was a big Chabad community, and it was called Kharkov. 
fine. Now, at the time, the Rebbe, his name was Shalom Dev Ber. Shalom Dev Ber of Lubavitch, he was the Rebbe. He was far away from Kar Kharkov getting medical treatment. So he was far away from Kharkov. So he was far away from the big Jewish city and uh, from most of the Chassidim. Wherever he was at the time, a chassid came to visit him, to speak to him. He had some question to ask a etza, etc. So when the chassid came to the Rebbe Rashab, the chassid said he's from Kharkov. So the Rebbe Rashab said, oh, you're from Kharkov? Was Herzog in Kharkov? What's happening over there in Kharkov? Give me a report. How's the teira? How's the learning? How's the milch sadim? What's going on? So the person said, you want to know what's going on in Kharkov? The learning is very weak. It's shvach. The davening, shvach, you're going to the shoals, it's not, uh, it's not real, you don't see the, you don't feel the dveikos, you don't feel like a baruch shvach. Gemil's chasadim, also very weak, there's not enough chasad there, people are narcissistic a bit. So, the Rebbe Rashab said, okay, and thanked him. A few hours later, another chasad came in, and the Rebbe Rashab, the chasad introduced himself, Chassid was also from Kharkov. So the Rebbe Rashab tells him, was Herzach in Kharkov? What's happening in Kharkov? So the person says, you want to know what's happening in Kharkov? I'll tell you. Mizitz to medaven, they're davening beautifully. Umil learns. The learning is incredible. Great learning in Torah. And the kindness and generosity is beautiful. It's mamish. Canadian Kharkov is <laughs> unbelievable. So the Rebbe Rashab was very happy. He smiled and he gave him a golden ruble. Huh? A coin. Token of appreciation. Okay. A few hours later, these two Hasidim encounter each other in the night. They start to schmooze and they repeat what happened, their interaction with the Rebbe. So the one who said that Kharkov, they don't learn so good, they don't dance so good, he was very upset. He's like, I didn't get a gold coin and the other Hasid gave the beautiful report, got a golden coin. He's upset. So he runs back to the Rebbe, he knocks on the door, comes and he tells the Rebbe, he says, it's not fair. It's not Yosha. He says, what's not Yosha? He says, the other guy come, came in and he tell you all beautiful things about Kharkov. You gave him a gold coin. He says, I told you the truth about Kharkov. I gave you the real MS. My report was the true report. I told you I was Melartanish, the Medavitanish, and you don't give me a gold coin. Why? So the Rebbe Rashab looks at him with a smile and tells him, you think I don't know what's going on in Kharkov? I know very, very well what's going on in Kharkov. I just wanted to see in what Kharkov do you live? And that's a question that we really face every day, each of us. In what Kharkov will we choose to live? We can choose to look back at our life and say, I live in Kharkov of destruction. I live in Churban Beis HaMikdash because I know myself and the truth is I have destroyed things. And because I destroyed maybe things in my own life and in others, I'm going to define myself more. What by that? And then I live in Kharkov. But every day, we also could wake up and say, I choose to live in a beautiful Kharkov, the Kharkov of Rabbi Akiva, the Kharkov that we learn that HaKadosh Baruch Hu builds, that after there's the Khurban, our life needs to be dedicated every moment, every daf we learn and every mitzvah we do to bayna elumas, to be building a beautiful, gracious, and godly world. Another year has passed, and we find ourselves once again being misabel on the Yerushalayim. The Gemara Bab Metzia on Lamed Amabes famously says, quotes Rabbi Yochanan who says, Lo harva Yerushalayim, that the reason why Yerushalayim was destroyed, according to the Maskan of the Gemara, is El Hashem midu dineyem al din Torah, v'lo avdu lifni mishur sadin. It's only because Kla Yisrael at that time so they were insistent on adjudicating, on deciding matters related to Chosh Mishpah, related to monetary disputes between one another, according to Din Torah, and they were unwilling to go ahead and go lifni mishur sadin, go beyond the letter of the law in order to accommodate for uh, for another. And Tosos there right away asks, he says, what are you talking about? Why is the Gemara now giving a new explanation as to why the Beis Amitash was destroyed? Because we know the Gemara in Yuma and Tesla says that the reason why the Beis Amitash was destroyed was because of Sinas Chinam. 
So if we have a very clear reason in the Gemara, in Yuma, why the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, Beis Hamikdash in Shalim was destroyed. So why is it necessary to come along and give a second explanation? And Tosso says, Yeshlomer de Havahagarma. And maybe it's that both of these factors, both Sinas Chinam, as well as the refusal to go lifni mishur sadin, both of those were contributing factors which led to the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash and the destruction of Yushalayim. Now, number one is that seemingly sinas chinam is a much more severe avera than not going lifni mishur sadin. Not going lifni mishur sadin means I have my rights. Uh, I don't want to accommodate for you. I don't want to compromise with you. I don't want to forego any of my rights in your favor. I'm going to be insistent on exercising my rights. So it's not necessarily the best behavior that a person should follow. But to go ahead and say that that's a reason for that's a factor as to why the base of Mikdash was destroyed. So that's pretty severe. We often struggle figuring out why Sinas Chinam is a reason for the Beis Hamikdash to be destroyed. But Sinas Chinam L'chol HaPachos is something which is pretty severe where people hate one another. But people who insist on going lifnim, who refuse to go Lifnim Mishur Sadin, they insist on following Din Torah and don't want to compromise. Okay, it's not so nice, but it's not so, it's not so bad. That's question uh, uh, number one. And number two is, Bechlal, how do we understand this idea that uh, if a person has a right to insist that uh, the money which is owed to him should be paid to him, so why is it so bad to go ahead and not be willing to compromise on that? Let the other person pay me what he owes me. Why do I have to compromise? Why do I have to go in order to accommodate for him? Let him go according to Din, which is that he owes me the money. So the, the notion that this is grounds for Yushalayim to be destroyed is something which is a little bit uh, curious. And in order to understand the nature of the day of Tisha B'Av, what being, we are being uh, misabal over, what we, are, uh, what we lost out when the base of Mitish was destroyed and Yushalayim was destroyed. So that's what we're going to try and understand. And I think a good starting point, a good springboard to understand this is to explore why it is that Chazal decided when they were sat down to figure out how we are going to commemorate Churban Beis Amitash, the fact that the Beis Amitash was destroyed and that Klai Yisrael was sent into Galus, how are we going to go ahead and commemorate that? How are we going to mark this, uh, this tragic event in our, uh, our nation's history? What's going to be the practice which we're going to adopt, which is going to express all of those emotions? And what Chazal decided to use as their model was Avelus. In choosing Avelus is a very curious thing, because Avelus is generally understood when a person dies, when a person is nifter, so there's an Avelus process, there's a mourning process, there's a grieving process, whereby we come to grips with the new reality of our loved one no longer being here together with us, in figuring out how to navigate what's essentially a new world without that loved one in, in our presence. So I can understand why it is that we would go ahead and there's a concept of Avelus for something which is so tragic like the uh, the loss of a, of a loved one. What does that have to do with Chorba Beis Amitash? Chorba Beis Amitash is the fact that we had a connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and, that, and we had a place where we could go and we could meet with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we could offer Korbanos, we could secure forgiveness, we could do Avoda in its ideal uh, manner. And now that place is no longer with us. So it's a tragic event what does that have to do with uh, what, what does that have to do with Avelus? We're not mourning necessarily the fact that people went ahead and died. That's not uh, that's not the focus. And it's even more curious when we think about the fact that in the Tefillah of Nachain, which we say uh, in the afternoon, we we Ashkenazim say in the afternoon of Tisha B'av. So we use the phrase Avelei Tzion v'Avelei Yushalayim. So those who mourn Sion and mourn Yerushalayim, so not being misabel over the people who died when the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, and all those graphic descriptions which uh, Chazal tells us in Gemara and Gitin, in the Kinos elaborate on and depict for us the tremendous loss of life which Klai Yisrael experienced experience at that time. But we're not necessarily being misabel over the loss of life. It's specifically something, something related to Sion and Yerushalayim. So what exactly does it mean to be misabel, to mourn over a city which was destroyed and a Beis Hamitish was destroyed? It's tragic, but why exactly did Chazal use the model of Avelus to go ahead and capture that? So I think part of that is to understand what exactly is happening when a person is nifter. 
and the significance of that in the on a spiritual level. What exactly is the importance of that in what that tries to convey? And we know that Gersh Baruch Hu created the world in this tremendous, tremendous uh, way, where one of the things which is mafli lasos, one of the things which is stunning and absolutely amazing, is that Gersh Baruch Hu's ability to link together both ruchni and gashmi, something which is spiritual together with something which is physical. So when we say in the bracha of Asher Yatzar, Asher Yatzar has hadam b'chachma of Rav on Nikavim Nikavim, and then we conclude Umafli Lasos. So many of them, before Shem explain that the Mafli Lasos is the fact that together with this physical body which we have, this behemoth dika body which we have, that there's a spiritual soul, there's a ruchnius element which is fused together with the body. A neshama which is taking mitachas kisei al kavod from the highest levels of of spirituality of ruchnius right beneath Hakadosh Baruch Hu himself, and he was able to combine that neshama into a body. And we know from many statements of Chazal that it's the existence of the neshama in the body which animates the body. That's what gives life to the body. That's what gives chius to uh, to the body. Is the fact that the neshama is is there. And that's why it's clear from uh, from Chazal that there has to be a neshama inside of the, a developing fetus while it's still inside of his mother's womb, because without the neshama there, there's no way the physical part of that body would be able to exist, would be able to grow, would be able to survive. So one of the most as- astonishing things which exists in creation is not just the physical creation, which is certainly an astonishing thing, a wondrous thing, but on a ruchniyistical level, what's most stunning about all of it is the combination of guf and neshama, the combination of ruchni and gashmi, spiritual together with physical. In death, we know is marked by, to try and measure it medically and try and pinpoint exactly the moment of death. And that's for the post to go ahead and decide on a uh, on a, a, a gashmius level, at what point halach is going to say that a person dies, but on a ruchnius dika level, so we know what the answer is. We may not be able to identify when exactly it occurs, but we know exactly what it is. In death is the moment that the neshama separates from the body. So during lifetime, we have ruchni and gashmi fused together into one. They're intermingled into one. They become one. And death is marked by the separation of the neshama from the goof. And the neshama goes back to the various different parts of the neshama go to different places. But the neshama, we'll just say very simply, goes back up to shamayim. And the goof now becomes this inanimate piece of, of just uh, goofni, goofy something which is just gashmi, something which is just physical, it doesn't really have any chiyos to it, doesn't have any life to it anymore, because the neshama has left it. And that's what we go ahead and we mark in terms of the avelos, because we believe that the neshama lives on. The neshama goes up to shamayim, the neshama goes through its process, what happens when it gets separated from the, the body, the neshama experiences pain, many of the halachas and many of the practices that we have in a shiva house are specifically revolve around this idea that the neshama is present and we're trying to be, be menachem, we're trying to offer comfort, not only to the survivors, not only to the avelim, but to the neshama itself, which is pained by the fact that it's been separated from its body. It's supposed to be together with the body. And we know that by tchiyas amesim, body and soul, neshama and goof, are going to be reunited one, one, once again for eternity. So that's the ultimate existence, the ideal existence, is for the ruchni and the gashmi to be together. And therefore, it's a tragic thing when there's we have to experience for a period of time the separation of the guf from the neshama. And that is ultimately what death is. And that's the tragedy of death is that the, the ruchni and the gashmi have been separated from one, from one another, that we no longer have access to our uh, ideal existence. And this is, this idea is not only limited to a person's body, but when you think about it, so we know that Chazal tell us in many places, Gabor and Tainus, for example, that the Beis Hamikdash in Yushalayim, that we have a Pasuk and tell him, Yushalayim Shechubra lo Yachtov. And Chazal say over there, Shechubra lo Yachtov means that there is a physical Beis Hamikdash which exists here on Aretz. There's a sanctuary, there's a place where, where, where we are able to go and connect with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And corresponding to that in Shemayim, there's also a Beis Hamikdash. There's a Beis Hamikdash Shemala as well. 
in Yerushalayim represents the place where we combine together those two things. And the combination of the Beis Amikta Shamat and the Beis Amikta Shamala is also a significant thing because it creates a conduit through which more Ruchnius is going to be able to enter into our physical world. And as we said, the purpose of the world is that fusion of Ruchni and Gashmi together. And we need to make sure the ideal existence is when those two things are, are able to combine together. And the destruction of the Beis Amitosh is a circumstance wherein we find out that the uh, that their connection, which is the ideal connection between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Kla Yisrael, the Beis Amitosh above and the Beis Amitosh below, when that connection is severed, so again, you could have left behind a physical structure of a Beis Amitosh, so you have the physical trappings of a Beis Amitosh, but once the Ruchnius of the Beis Amitosh is taken away, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, there's no longer room for me here in this physical world based on what's currently happening, I need to go back up to Shema so this is again a separation of Ruchni, the neshama of the world, from the goof, from the physical trappings of the world, which was the Beis Hamikdash itself. And when we see before our eyes the fact that the Beis Hamikdash lost its Ruchni's quality, its Ruchni's characteristic, and that's all gone back up to Shemaim, and now you have just a physical Beis Hamikdash down here, which once it loses its Ruchni's, it it, it the uh, the uh, it could be destroyed, it could be burned down to the ground because it's lost its chiyus, and the source for that chiyus, the ruchnis, has gone ban- back up to Shemaim. So that is a grounds for Avelus. That's a ground, the same reason why we're misable when a person passes away, because the ruchni has separated from the guf, because the spirituality has left from the uh, from the physical. So Churban Beis Amitish represents a similar process where the ruchnis didn't go away, it just went to a different place. It went into a different dimension. It went back up to Shemaim. And we mourn when things do not exist in the ideal manner of Neshama and Guf together, Ruchni is together with Gashmi is together. But when the two parts have to be separated from one another, from one another that is the tragedy and that is the loss of what we have. In that same phrase that Ir Shechubra La Yachtov, which is used, which is depicted by Chazal in some context to talk about the Beis Amita Shamala being connected with the Beis Amita Shamata. So we find a similar thing that Yushalayim is also a place which is meant to bring together HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the ultimate Ruchni, and Klal Yisrael, which are his, his children, as it were, but we are physical in, by our very nature. In the place where we have the opportunity, the best opportunity to be able to connect with Ruchni, when Klai Yisrael is able to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is in the Beis HaMikdash itself. That's where the Shechina is Shorah. That's where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to take my divine presence and I'm going to allow it, to, I'm going to find a place for it to be able to dwell here on earth there on earth, together with us, Klai Yisrael, so we have, an, we have an opportunity to connect with HaKadosh Baruch Hu at that time. In Chorban Beis Amitash represents not only the loss of the connection between the Beis Amitash Shamata and the Beis Amitash Shamala, but also represents the loss of us, our us, Kla Yusuf, physical beings, being, a, being able to connect with the ultimate Ruchni, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that also is part of the tragedy which, which is there. And that's why the, uh, in the, the Tefillah of Nachem, it says, Havela, when, right after it says that we're we, the, the mourners of Tzion and Shalayim, it says, Havela mi bli baneha, because Yushalayim is something which is there in order to be able to bring HaKadosh Baruch Hu's children into his domain, into his place, so that we could connect with him, so that we as physical beings could connect with him, a spiritual being, and we could have that connection, that mafli la sosa, bringing us together with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And once the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, and once Harva Yushalayim, Yushalayim was destroyed, so that ability to connect the Ruchni and the Gashmi was lost, and that becomes an Avelus. And you have a city of Yushalayim, which could be there, but if it's desolate of the Jewish people, even if the physical location is there, Kedusha Rishon, Akitsha Lasi Lavo, that the Kedusha remains in place even without a Beis Hamikdash, and even without Kla Yusuf being there, 
but seeing the physical trappings of Yerushalayim without her children being there, without Klai Yisrael being there, and not being able to be used for its designed purpose to create the connection between those of us who are here on earth, those of us who are physical beings, together with the ultimate Ruchni, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so that is the greatest tragedy which we could experience, and that's why uh, well, the Klai Yisrael uh, uh, Chazal chose the mode of Avelus in order to capture the essence of what Churba Beis Amitosh and Churba Yushalayim is about, because all of that Avelus is the separation of the Neshama from the Guf, and Churba Beis Amitosh represents the separation of the base of the Beis Amitosh Shamala from the Beis Amitosh Shamata, also a separation of Ruchni from Gashmi, and that also is a tragedy of Yushalayim. Yushalayim is a place where where HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Kala Yisrael are supposed to be able to meet, where the Shechina is Shor, the Shechina is supposed to reside, and now that that doesn't happen anymore, that doesn't exist anymore, that opportunity has been lost, so it's an Avelis for that separation of, of Ruchni from Gashmi. But I think it's a, a little bit even deeper than that. And I think the deeper part of that is, is that we know that there are certain mitzvahs for which Mepharshim tell us that they are mitzvahs which are not given to individuals. They can't really be fulfilled fully by an individual. These are Klaliyas dik of type of mitzvahs. We need the, the, the totality of Klal Yisrael in order to be able to tap into that mitzvah. Shabbos is one of those things. Matan Torah was one of those things. Mepharshim say that Kodesh Baruch Hu didn't do a Matan Torah for Avram Avinu. He didn't do it for Yitzchak Avinu. He didn't do it for Yaakov Avinu. He didn't even do it for Yaakov Avinu and the Shiv Teka together because Matan Torah, the Torah is something which is supposed to be experienced by Klal Yisrael. You need a nation of Klal Yisrael in order to be able to connect to Kodesh Baruch Hu and to be able to receive his Torah. And as great as the Avos were, as great as the Shiv Teka were, as great as they, as they were, they weren't Am Yisrael. They weren't Kla Yisrael to be Zohar to the Torah, and we have many things which are like that. So the Hashras Hashchina, so Hakadosh Baruch Hu's connection to Kla Yisrael by allowing and in, in sending His divine presence down by entering into this physical world is also one of those things which necessitates Kla Yisrael as a whole. The same way by Matan Torah, we know that Chazal teaches us that the reason why it was, uh, it was able to be given is because not only was there a Klai Yisrael, but it was Ki'ish Echad B'Lev Echad. There was a unity of purpose, a unity of mind, a unity of connection with one another. And therefore, when everybody combines together all of their kochos and all of their potential, when that combines together, so then we come, become worthy of the Torah because there's no one person who could fulfill all Tar Yag Mitzvahs, because some mitzvahs are for a king, and some mitzvahs are for a Kohen, and some mitzvahs are for women, and there's all sorts of different mitzvahs, and it's impossible for any one person to be able to fulfill them all. But we combine together, when we see ourselves as a unified Klal Yisrael, as one, as, as a unit of Klal Yisrael, so then we become Zohar to the Torah, because the totality of Klal Yisrael could go ahead and fulfill the totality of, of Torah. And that's why the Shechina is something which is so essential that even, though, even on a minor scale, the Gemara and Sota tells us that ish v'isha, that when there's a man and a woman, zahu, if they merit, so Shechina b'neim, the Shechina is able to reside in their home. But if you separate them out, so if you have the ish over here and the ish over there, and they're not combined together, the Shechina cannot reside in that house. It requires the joint effort of the two of them together to bring HaKadosh Baruch Hu into, into their home. And in the same way for Klal Yisrael, in order to be worthy recipients of a Beis Hamikdash, of a Yerushalayim, a functioning Yerushalayim, on a Ruchni Yisdikah level, where Akash Baruch is going to look down from Shemaim and say, that's a place where I feel comfortable. That's a place where I, uh, where I look forward to being able to connect together with, the, the, uh, with Klal Yisrael. Only when that happens, does the Shechina, does it feel comfortable and is it willing to enter into our world? But when Klai Yisrael don't want to go ahead and do that, when they refuse to do that, so then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if there's no shalom b'neim, if there's no peace b- between them, so then there's no place for me here, and I need to go back up to my ruchni yisdika place, and we'll leave behind the empty shell of the, uh, of the, of the guf, of a Beis Amitash without any spirituality which could be destroyed. You could have Yushalayim without her children there, Bumi Bli Baneha, without her children. And that's the greatest tragedy and the greatest loss which we could experience 
akin to the loss of a, of a person where uh, it's a, it's just an empty shell of what was without it being used in its ideal manner. In this idea of the unity of Klai Yisrael, in their other uh, uh, place in Chazal, there's Yushalmi, where they use the same phrase that Yushalayim is Ir Shechubra La Yachdav. It's a place where Klai Yisrael is designed to be Chaveirim Zelazeh, that they're supposed to be friends with one another, like we say in Kiddush HaChodesh, uh, 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 every month on Shabbos Mavorchim, we say that Chaverim call Yisrael, that Yishalayim is a place where we're supposed to make everybody Chaverim, everybody is supposed to connect with one another. And this idea is expressed very beautifully, I think, by Revolba. When he talks about where it says, Kiheim Chayenu, where he say that the Torah is our life, and we need to think about Kla Yisrael in terms of being a living organism. That's the muscle that uh, that he uses, and when we think of uh, of uh, Klai Yisrael as a living organism, so we know as an organism, as a body, many times is used as the muscle. So a body, although it's comprised of all sorts of different parts, different the uh, ramach so there's 630 different parts which which combined make a body. So one could look at the person in terms of their parts, or one could look at them in terms of the combination of all of that, which ends up making a singular goof. And really what we need to do, what we need to focus on is to realize that HaKash Baruch Hu does not want us to be 613 separate Avar and, and Gidim, different parts of the, the body. HaKash Baruch Hu wants us to see ourselves as part of a unified Chaim, a unified life, which is all of the different parts together. The heart isn't life, and the brain isn't life, and fingers aren't life, and feet aren't life. It's only when you have all of those different things together do we say a person is alive, is a person animate, is a person capable of achieving their uh, their potential. And the phrase he uses is, hachayim enam mischalkim le'evarim. That when we're talking about a person's life, we don't divide that into limbs. We look at life as the unified existence of the thing all by itself. And that's really what the tragedy of Chorban Beis Hamikdash, that's what Chazal are coming to teach us over here, because it's one thing to go ahead and say that there's Sinas Chinam. When we hear that there's Sinas Chinam, the Gemara and Yuma, which says that Sinas Chinam was the cause of the, of the destruction of Beis Hamikdash, that's certainly true, because Sinas Chinam, when Kla Yisrael could descend to such a point where they despise one another, they hate one another, so that we understand that there's a loss of unity, and Baruch Hu may say, I don't want to be interested. But it could be even more subtle than that. And I think that's what the Gemara in Bab Metziah is trying to teach us, that it doesn't necessarily have to be a sinas chinam, an outright hatred for one another. Outright hatred is, it's clear that there's a disconnect between people. People see Kla Yisrael as a varim rather than chayim. They see them as limbs rather than as a, as a unified uh, body. But it's even more subtle than that when we realize that the when people say, I don't want to go ahead and compromise. I'm going to go according to din, and I don't want to go lifnim mishura sadin. What would be the reason that a person is going to say, I'm going to go only according to din, the strict letter of the law, this is what my rights are, and I'm going to exercise every single one of them, to the exclusion of going lifnim mishura sadin. That stems from a perspective where I see myself as separate and apart from you. If I see myself as separate and apart from you, there's my interests in your interests. You are trying to encroach. You are trying to cross over into my interests. And I don't want to let you do that. I'm going to defend. I'm going to defend my rights financially because those are my rights and those are your rights. And you are trying to take away my rights. I'm not going to go ahead and let you take away my rights. They're mine and they're not yours. So when a person takes that attitude of, I'm going to go only according to Din Torah, and I refuse to go, that's a recognition at the source. If you distill it down to the, the attitude to its source, what that means is, is I see myself as separate and apart from you. There's mine and there's yours. And since you're trying to take mine, I'm going to refuse and I'm going to exercise my rights. That attitude doesn't see us as unified together. That attitude doesn't see us as connected with one another, as somehow part of different limbs of the same body. And when Kla Yisrael adopts this perspective that there's me and there's you, and we are separate, we're, they're separate, uh, uh, separate entities, separate limbs, there's the hand and the foot, and the hand is going to go ahead and fight against the foot. 
because they have different interests and they're both tr- trying to get the same nutrients and the same blood flow and the same as everything else. An autoimmune disease, which is very dangerous because the body ends up fighting itself. So that is what happens when Klai Yisrael adopts the attitude that they refuse to go lifni mishra sadin and they insist on going only according to uh, to din. And that happens when we can't make space for one another, we can't be understanding of one another, we can't go ahead and accommodate other people's opinions and other people's attitudes and even other people's behavior sometimes, when we refuse to go ahead and accommodate and to understand and to be able to appreciate that there's different people and there's different limbs and they have different functions, but they could all be part of the same overall body, when we lose sight of that, Takarish Baruch Hu says, this is essentially the same as Sinas Chinam that they're the same thing, not that so much like Toso says, that they're zev ze gorem, but the fact that zev ze ultimately stem from the same thing. Sinas china means there's me and there's you, and I hate you and I despise you. And obviously you're separate from me if I could hate you. And the refusal to go leaf nimishur then means there's my rights and there's your rights. And chaser shalom, should I go ahead and have to compromise my rights to accommodate for you? You should be giving me what's due to me. But that attitude where a person says, I have my rights, I'm going to insist on my rights, and I refuse to accommodate what you want to do, I refuse to compromise with you, because I'm, I, I'm concerned with my interests, to exclusion of your interests, as soon as we see ourselves as separate from one another, there's a breakdown in the achdus, there's a breakdown in the unity of Klai Yisrael, and once there's a breakdown of the unity of Klai Yisrael, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, my shechina can only reside in a place of shalom. My shechina can only reside in a place where ish v'isha, that there's zachu, that they merit to have shalom be, between them. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says on a Klaliistic level, he can only be in Yushalayim. He can only connect with Klai Yisrael when there is a unified Klai Yisrael. But when Klai Yisrael says, we're not unified, I have my rights and I'm going to exercise my rights and I'm going to enforce my rights and I'm not going to make any space for you whatsoever. I'm not going to demonstrate any interest whatsoever in your rights or your interests. And I refuse to compromise. Then you don't have a body. Then you don't have a living being, which is Klai Yisrael. And once Klai Yisrael loses their status as that Isha Chad Kaleva Chad, and we're a bunch of individual limbs which are running around, each one exercising their, their, their own pursuits and their own interests and their own rights, Akash Baruch Hu says, I don't want anything to do with this. This is not for me. And I'm going to take the Ruchnius back up to Shemaim. And I'm going to leave you there as a separate body to go ahead and figure out how to reconnect with one another, how to recreate that unity, whereby everybody's willing to go lifnim mishra sadin. You're willing to give and you're willing to compromise and you're willing to forego your rights because there's a bigger picture, which is more important. There's a bigger body, which is much more important than I as an individual cell or I as an individual limb within that body. And if the body is going to be healthy, all the different parts and all the different systems and all the different organs, ultimately they need to get along with one another. Because when that autoimmune disease exists, where the body is fighting within itself, so that becomes very uncomfortable, very painful, and very difficult, and that represents an illness of the body itself. And that's what happened in the time of Chorba Beis Hamikdash. That's what the Gemara in Bab Metzia is teaching us when Rabbi Yochanan says that the reason why Yushalayim was destroyed is because they insisted on going according to Din, and they wouldn't go Lifni Meshur Sadin. And that represents at its core the inability of people to get along with one another, that represents a breakdown of the Achtos. And once there's a breakdown of the Achtos and we don't have the status of Klal Yisrael, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going back up to Shemaim. I will bring my Shechina here into this physical world when you are unified as a people. But when you splinter apart and when you are unwilling to compromise and unwilling to go lifnim Mishur Sadin with one another, I'm going back up to Shemaim. Give me a call when you figured it out, when you've realized how essential it is for the function of Kla Yisrael, for the function of the universe, for the purpose of the universe and the destiny of the universe, for that Achdus to be reestablished. And only once you go ahead and you reestablish, if you could do your part of reestablishing that Achdus, repairing the Sinas Chinam, like the Gemara in, in Yuma talks about. And when we could go Lifnim Mishur Saden instead of insisting on our rights, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, then we can have a third base amitish, then we could join together and bring things back. We don't have to be misabel on the separation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu from Klai Yisrael, 
on the loss of the Shekhinah leaving behind a shell of a body which just barely holds on to life, which barely has a chiyus to it. But HaKash Baruch Hu says, when you go ahead and you could unify once again, you can make all of the necessary repairs, then we'll have a third base amitash, I will come back into this world. All of the ideal purpose of the world will come back together with the Ruchni and the Gashmi, the physical and the spiritual, fusing together and unifying together once again. In the Mitzvah Hashem, we should be able to appreciate that. And we should realize that we can't expect other people to go ahead and generate the Achtos. This is something which each one of us has to do on our own. We have to make the effort on our own to be compromising and to go and to be understanding, accommodating, and make space for other people, even if they're different from ourselves and they may have slightly different views from ourselves and they may see Torah Mitzvahs from a different angle than we do. But ultimately, with Shivan Panim the Torah, we can, make, we can accommodate the different people who are loyal to Torah, even with the different nuanced ways that they go ahead and do so. And when we figure out how to unify, how to once again restore Ki'isha Chad, Balei Chad, Hashem, we should be Zoha, that we will no longer have to be Mis Abel, Aveli Tzion, Aveli Yushalayim, and we should all be able to go back to Yushalayim, Habnuya, Mirz Hashem, Bekaru Biyamenu. friends, another Tisha B'Av has passed, mourning the destruction of Beit HaMikdash, weeping, sitting on the ground, and unfortunately Mashiach is still not here. What are we doing wrong? They tell us in at Hinam, they tell us baseless hatred, the Shonara, Tzedakah, learning Torah, we're doing all that. Why then is Mashiach still not here? Why then is Hashem not rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash? So maybe we could offer an explanation and we could still work on it and Hashem could send Mashiach at any given moment. The Midrash says that when Isav hears that Yaakov Avinu takes a barakot from his father Yitzhak, the Midrash says that there were three tears involved. One tear fell out of Isav's left eye, one tear fell out of Isav's right eye, and one tear was stuck in the eye that didn't come down. Says the Midrash, because he cried and it says on him, Isa Vayzaak, Mordechai also, by the story of the Megillah and Esther, it also says Vayzaak. And not only that, all the suffering and the pain and tragedies and the problems throughout the centuries of the Jewish nation and Jewish history are all because of those three tears from Isa Rasha. And the question is like this. I saw in one of the Hasidic masters, it escapes me right now his name, but he asks like this. He says, we have a concept in our Judaism in our Torah, in the rules, batel b'shishim, batel berov, batel b'me'a, which means in very simple layman terms, the classic example we all know, a drop of milk falls in the bucket or in a pot of meat. If you have 60 times the meat more than a drop of milk, it's canceled, it's nullified. You can eat the pot of meat. So how then, these three tears, weren't they canceled with all the tears that we have shed throughout the centuries? We didn't cry enough in the Holocaust. We didn't cry enough in the pogroms. We didn't cry enough in all the annihilations and all the tragedies and all the problems. Those tears were not enough to cancel out the tears of Esav. How could it be? How could it be that still today the Beit HaMikdash is still not rebuilt because the tears of Esav are still not nullified, still not canceled? There was a great Rebbe that he once, went, he went once to, um, he went once, pardon me, he went once to a hotel and he wanted to stay there for the night. And the hotel owner, he gave him a very nice room, hospitality, everything very nice. And he's over there at 12 o'clock, midnight, around midnight at night. And he hears the person next door in the room, right next door to him, crying and saying, Ah, oh, oh, it hurts so much, it hurts so much. Now this rabbi said, unbelievable, I hit the jackpot, I won the lottery. I'm here next to one of the Sadiqim of the generation. Wow, he's for sure crying over the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. He's doing something called Tikkun Hatzot, where every Yehudi is supposed to wake up approximately at midnight, sit on the floor, and weep over the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. He says, for sure, this is, this is one of the guys. Five minutes pass, and he hears even more groaning and more moaning. 
And he hears the person say, Ugh, it hurts so bad. Make it stop. It hurts so bad. The rabbi says, Wow, unbelievable. This is for sure one of the 36 sadikim, 36 hidden sadikim and the righteous people in the century. For sure. And the rabbi is so pleased with what he hears. Five minutes pass and he says, he hears the person next to the room next door say, Ugh, it hurts so bad. Get me some Tums. Get me some Tums. I shouldn't have ate that oatmeal or I shouldn't have ate that omelet before I went to sleep. I have so much heartburn. The rabbi says, Ah, those tears were in vain. I thought they were holy tears. And I come to realize and know and understand there were tears in vain. The rabbi say, Esav Rasha was crying because of this world. Because he was running after this world. When Yaakov Avinu gets all the blessings from Yitzhak, Yitzhak is giving him Mishmane Haaretz, Rob Dagam Vetirosh, all about this world. Esav says, I want this world. That's what I'm crying about. Unfortunately, when we cry, we're also crying about this world. When do we realize that we need Beit HaMikdash? When things that we have in this world are no longer here. When there's inflation, when problems in the stock market, when the tuition bill gets high, when mortgage rates get high, interest rates get high, then we start remembering about Mashiach. So therefore, it's not canceled, it's not nullified, it's the same exact tears. I once heard a story a very long time ago, details are not important, but the message rings very true. There was a Rebbe, different Rebbe, there was a Rebbe that had a person come to him every single year and ask for advice. And he would come to him and he says, buy this stock, buy that stock, this is good, this is not good. And the person would leave not understanding how the Rebbe would possibly know about stocks and the business transactions of the world. But he trusted his Rebbe. One year, this person comes and he says, Rebbe, now what? What do I do now? What stocks do you have in mind? He says, I'm telling you, pull all your money out of the stock market. He says, Rebbe, what are you talking about? He says, I'm telling you, pull all your money out of the stock market. He says, fine, Rebbe, I'll do that. But how do you know? You know, I never had the audacity to ask you every single year, how do you know about the stock market? But how do you know I should pull my money out this year? He says, because when you come, right before you every single year, a very wealthy philanthropist comes, a very wealthy businessman comes, and he tells me, this stock is good, that stock is good. He only wants my blessing. He knows I, I don't know anything about stocks or Wall Street or anything, but he wants my beracha, he wants my blessing, and I give him a beracha. However, this year he came, and I asked him, no, let's call him Reuven. No, Reuven, how's it going on Wall Street in the stock markets? And he turns to me and he says, Rebbe, we need Mashiach. What could I tell you? We need Mashiach. And when I heard him say, we need Mashiach, I understood that the stock market is going to crash. Therefore, I'm telling you, pull all your money out. We don't think about Mashiach when everything is good because we've become so complacent, so comfortable, so numb in the, in the situations that we're in, in the, in the environment that we're in. When do we start thinking about Mashiach? Like I said, when push comes to shove, says the Rebbe, he says, no, 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 no. That's Mashiach, the tears of Esav are not canceled, they're not, they're not nullified because they're crying the same exact tears. It's very hard for us, it's very hard for us when we say the Amidah, we say, Hashem, please sprout forth the coming of Mashiach. Dwell in Yerushalayim, just like you said. It's very hard for us to relate what is Bet HaMikdash, what is Mashiach, in fact, what is it? It's very hard for us to relate and to cry and to concentrate, to have kavana in those words. But if we just think about something so simple, very tragic, but so simple, then maybe we could start shedding tears. Maybe we could start nullifying the tears of Esav, crying about Hashem's name being desecrated. Instead of crying about our own materialistic needs, what is in it for me? What am I going to gain when Mashiach comes? Maybe that's why every year Shabbat Av is in the summertime. Why? Because everybody's so hung up about their homes, their dreams, their vacations. Hashem says, what about my home? What about the Shekhinah coming out from the dirt? What about the Shekhinah coming out from the mud? Why don't you think about that? Maybe that's why it comes every year and Shabbat Av comes in the summertime. Because it's not about you. Stop, stop being so self-centered, egocentric, only conceited, thinking only about yourself. It's not about you. It's about Hashem. What about Hashem's home? What about 19-something years, 1950-something years? Hashem doesn't have a home. What about that? So something very simple, tragic, Chama Vadiya Halav used to always say, look at the millions of children that don't even know how to say Shema Israel. How about that? We should cry about that. 
but that they don't even know how to sanctify Hashem's name, unify Hashem's name, come close to Hashem. Can we cry about that? Can we cry about people that don't even know they're Jewish, Bechlal? They are. They don't even know that they're Jewish. That's something we should cry about. When they captured the, in the Six Day War, when they captured the Kotel, the Kotel was back in the hands of Jewish people. So there were two students in Yeshiva, one student turns to another and he says, Oh, let's go see the Kotel, what remained of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, of our Holy Temple. So his friend turned to him, he says, You don't have to go to the Kotel to see the destruction of the Temple. Just open your window and see the people desecrating Shabbat. People walking around the street not even know who, knowing who Hashem is. On that we have to cry. And if we cry those, those tears, we can nullify, we can nullify the tears of Esav speedily in our days. We don't have to wait only once a year to I have to start remembering, oh, we need Mashiach, we need the Beit HaMikdash. Every single day we have three times an opportunity in the Amidah to say those words. Concentrate on those words. Have Kavanah on those words. Concentrate to nullify the tears of, of Esav Rasha and to bring forth the coming of Mashiach in our tears of pure tears, of holy tears, when we really cry because we want Hashem to have a, a home again. Ba'adat Hashem should be speedily in our days. Amen. We would like to welcome back Rabbi Gladstein to our Tisha program. Um, Baruch Hashem, we've had this host to have Rabbi Gladstein on many times in our program and for Tisha B'Av. And here we are again in Golos on Tisha B'Av. We hoped we'll be in Yerushalayim and hopefully uh, it's going to happen soon, but as of now, here we are. So I would like to welcome you, welcome you back. Rabbi Gladstein is the Marta Asra in Kehillus the Ferris Mordechai in Cedarhurst, and he's about Machab Svarim, the Sefer Magad Rekia, and many books, um, especially the book for Tishabov, The Darkness and the Dawn. For those who want, can look for it and uh, get started. Um, Rabbi Gladstein, I know you just finished, came back from a trip to Spain and Portugal, and I believe you've seen destruction. There were many, many kahillas over there, kahillas that you probably can't believe that it was vibrant, full of Yiddishkeit, and now probably is pretty empty. If you can tell the audience a little bit of what you saw and the inspiration that you got. Yeah. Uh, Menachem, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is an appropriate time of the year to talk about this subject. You know, talk about uh, communities in Spain. There were Jewish communities there for at least uh, 800 years. The Rishonim lived there. You had uh, the greatest of all the Rishonim. You had, of course, the Rashba in Barcelona, the Ran, the Ramban, in Garona, Rabbeinu Yoyna, and of course the Rambam. The Rambam was born in Cordova, and uh, many, many Rishinim, dozens of Rishinim, and there were very eminent uh, Jewish communities. Menachem, there's nothing there. There's nothing to see. We thought we would go, we would see re remnants, relics, imprints, uh, some kind of uh, Not there's nothing to see. The country is empty and void. There's no Ruach and there's no Geshem. Nothing. It was startling. <laughs> Prepared a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of information to talk about <clears throat> the, some of the great Rishonim. Okay, some of the streets, you know, the Rajva street. Very good. But there's, there's no apparent evidence that Jews ever lived in that country. There's no shame the Sha'iras. The closest you'll see is in some doorways. There's like a little uh, crevice where, you know, once upon a time there was a mezuzah there. But that's it. There's no um, bate kvaris. There are no cemeteries. There are no kvarim. There's nowhere to daven. The rush was in Toledo. Nowhere to daven. Not for the rush. Not for the rajba. Not for the ramban. Not for the ran. Not for Abbe Yoyna. They did a very good job. And, uh, you know, Rabbi Gedalia Shor points out that uh, something we could observe throughout Jewish history is that when the Golos comes to an end, then we leave overnight. It's not like the, the Goyim, they come and say, you know, we think the time is up. We're going to give you a couple of months. You could sell your homes. You could pack your bags. You could take 
all of your stuff with you. Now, when the galus is up, it's all over. There's nothing. Uh, uh, the next night, we're out of there. And Rukhdal Yishor explains that based on our Chaim HaKadosh, the concept of galus is uh, to gather the Nitzaytzis of Kedusha that were scattered all over the world. But once we're finished gathering in those sparks, then oh, next night, we're on to the next. There's There's no delay. And that's what we see in Spain. In Spain, it's like we took every last spark of Kedusha out and uh, there's nothing left. You know, I'll, I'll share with you something very uh, powerful. It's even difficult to talk about it uh, publicly. It's a question I had for many years. And I even offered an explanation and I wrote it. And many people really... Um, it was, it was an approach that really resonated with a lot of people, but going back to Spain and Portugal, I think there are other answers possibly to this question. And this is a very important question. You know, on Tisha B'Av, we mourn many tragedies besides the actual Churban Beis HaMikdash. Of course, we mourn the Asare Haruge Malchus, but we, we mourn the Crusades. Didn't happen at the time of the Churban. It happened a uh, thousand years later. We mourn the burning of the Shas, 1242. We mourn the Holocaust. So there are many tragedies that we speak about on Tisha B'Av. And it really troubled me. Why is there no mention of the Spanish expulsion in 1492? I mean, 300,000 Jews were expelled from the country. And everybody knows or should know that it happened on Tisha B'Av. <laughs> it happened on Tisha B'Av. So it's not like we're sticking to the script. Only Eicha, only Chorim Eis HaMikdash. We talk about things that happened throughout the generations. And the Spanish expulsion was one of the greatest tragedies that ever happened to Jewish people. Why do we omit it? On t- it's like conspicuously absent. Especially that Barbano writes in one of his introductions that Ferdinand and Isabel, they didn't know. They didn't, they didn't like look on the calendar. Hey, let's schedule the explosion for a date that, you know, is well known to be a day of mourning for the Jewish people. They, as far as they, they were concerned, they picked a date out of the hat. But it's like Tisha is a lightning rod. And when there's tragedy that happens, it happens then. Right? We know World War I broke out on Tisha B'Av. The Jews were expelled from France on Tisha B'Av, from England on Tisha B'Av, throughout the generation. I remember when I was a kid, my shul, the Aguda of Avenue L in Brooklyn, it burnt down on Tisha B'Av. <laughs> Everybody knows when there's tragedy that happens, it happens on Tisha B'Av. And here the Spanish expulsion divinely orchestrated clearly that it was scheduled for Tisha B'Av. And we don't even talk about it on Tisha B'Av. It's omitted. So in the past, I used the following approach. And I think there's a lot of truth to it. But there's something uh, there's something more, more I, th- I believe. You know, the G'daylam who lived in those times, when the Jews were leaving Spain, they, they paskin that even though it was Tisha B'Av, they should play live music. Why? One of the reasons is the Jews were so depressed and they're so downtrodden, they're so broken that they, the, the Rabbanim of the time felt it was, it was a question of life and death. The Jews were in danger of just being utterly crushed, demoralized. So they needed to lift their spirits. But there was another message as well. And that is, as painful as it was to leave the country where we thro- uh, flourished for 700 years, for 800 years. But we're not leaving our home. We're leaving the Gullus. And a Jew never cries when he leaves the Gullus. And as difficult as it was, we played music to recognize we never belonged in Spain in the first place. That's not our home. Our home is Eretz Yisrael. You can't cry when you leave the Gullus. You can't be attached to the gullus. You can't mourn when a gullus is over. Gullus is over. It's not easy. It's not easy being uh, completely transported to a different uh, country. No money. Broken. No livelihood. Strangers and a stranger. But at the end of the day, a Jew doesn't cry when they leave the gullus. And I believe this is a true answer. But... You know, look, I know, uh, Menachem, on your show, you know, you speak about the issues that uh, others are maybe afraid to talk about. So I think this has to be mentioned. 
after studying, I did a lot of research to be able to speak. We had a very chash about Elam. We had about 40 people, educated people, Erlecha people. So I was doing research about the times that these G'daylam lived in and the communities flourished in. You know, in 1391 in Spain, 200,000 Jews were forcibly converted and baptized. 200,000 Jews. Just think about the magnitude of that number. 200,000 Jews were forced to leave the religion. Okay, so you'll say, look, their lives were threatened. And obviously, who could judge them? And they had no choice. And inwardly, many observed Judaism privately, but not everyone. Not everyone. But here's what the, the painful thing is. And I'm going to come back to the really painful thing in a moment. But I want, I want to let you know that in 1492, many Jews went, then went to Portugal. Because at the time, Portugal did not have a policy of, of uh, expulsion. So Jews went to Portugal. But five years later, King Manuel of Portugal wanted to marry Ferdinand and Isabel's daughter. So they said, look, you want, you want this girl who has a shidduch, here, here are the tanaim. The tanaim are, you have too many Jews in your country. So you agree to expand expulsion to Portugal. You have her hand in marriage. So he married her. And though that was the condition of the marriage. Now, he, he, was, he understood that his economy was dependent on the Jews. So he gave them a certain amount of months, six to 10 months, to liquidate their assets and to get ready to leave. But he didn't wait for that. So on the first day of Pesach, he rounded all the Jews up and he said, either you convert or your children are being kidnapped. And the King Emmanuel kidnapped every single child below the age, the age of 18 and no parents saw their children again. This is something that's not so well known. There was a Rishine who lived in Spain, Reb Avram Saba, the Tzrar Hamar, who went to Portugal. He had two children kidnapped, baptized. He never saw them again. These children were taken off to an island off of Africa where there's an entire island just of Yiddish Kindalach who were, who were uh, converted. And we have no, we have no shame of Sha'iris of them. So I want to ask you a question. If for a hundred, now, here's an important fact. The Inquisition was in effect for a very long time before the Jews were expelled in 1492. You see, the Inquisition was that any Jew who was threatened to convert and converted can now not go back to practice Judaism. If a Jew maintained themselves as Jewish people, they were allowed to practice Judaism. So before 1492, you had Jews who uh, preserved their heritage and they're, they're, they were not being uh, investigated. They only investigated people who converted to Christianity and were suspected of really observing Judaism. That was the Inquisition. So we, they were inquisitive. Are these converts being faithful to Christianity? So I'll ask you a very simple question. In the scheme of history. What was worse? The forceful conversions for a hundred years of hundreds of thousands of Jews? Or the fact that Jews were expelled in 1492? What do you think was worse? That hundreds of thousands of Jews left the Yiddishkeit? What's a bigger tragedy? That Jews left our religion by the, by the droves? Or the fact that in 1492, Spain said, okay, enough is enough. I understand many people converted, but anyone who didn't convert, you got to leave. I mean, in the scheme of things, that wasn't such a big deal compared to the fact that we lost hundreds of thousands of Jews in the last hundred years. So to commemorate what happened on Tishba 1492 is really insulting if you think about it. And a lack of appreciation and understanding and now knowing and being educated what was going on for, for decades before that. But probably the most painful thing 
is that there were Rabbonim that didn't withstand the test. And without getting into too much detail, one of the great Rabbonim, Rabbi Solomon Levi, when he was challenged by the church, he converted. And his Talmud, Rabbi Shua Halorki, he disparaged the Rebbe. How could you leave our people? How could you abandon us? How can you turn your back on us? And the Rebbe challenged him to a debate. And Yeshua Halorki converted. So what do you think that did to the morale of uh, the communities? What do you think that did? Now, these weren't uh, of the caliber of perhaps Saba Arbanel and Rabbi Ram Saba, but you know, to be aware of what was taking place in the time, you know, we know the Ramban had a famous student, Avner, that uh, many Svarim talk about. The Ramban talks about. The Kavayosha talks about. So I'm not trying to, uh, you know, reveal things that are not known. This is, uh, you know, it's written about in all the Svarim. But the pressures of the time, so I would say like this. Number one, you think it brings COVID to Klal Yisrael if we were going to really focus in on what, what, what was happening then in a way it's it's almost impossible to talk about and in a way it's disparaging to talk about you're going to talk about that Jews left their Spain that's what you're going to remember why because it happened on Tisha B'av. but vis-a-vis what was taking place um, first of all in the Inquisition if you're suspected of practicing Judaism so they would either torture you until you admit Either that you um, that you you wholeheartedly embrace Christianity, or, or they torture you. So I think there are a number of reasons why the Spanish Inquisition was not uh, is not discussed too much on Tisha B'av. Number one, like we said, you can't cry when you leave the Galas. Number two, the whole saga and the whole period, in a way, it's it's embarrassing for us. And number three, and this is something I saw in the Ravid. Now, just historically, you know, there were three Ravids. Um, the Ravid that we always talk about, the Ramam and the Ravid, that's the Ravid II, the Ravid of Pokiers. We spoke about, about the Ravid of Pokiers last year when we visited France. He's the Ravid Balha Hasagais. The first Ravid wrote a Sefer HaKabbalah. He was uh, one of the Rishonim. He lived in Spain. And he wrote a work of history from the beginning of time until his time. And he says something, and I think this is another reason why we don't talk about the period of, of what happened in Spain. He says, expulsion, that's similar to the Chorban. We were expelled in times of the Chorban. Hunger, we experienced that in time of the Chorban. Deprivation, persecution, Similar to the Chorban. Forced conversion, worse than the Chorban. Forced conversion, worse than the Chorban. He doesn't say this to answer any questions. He just makes this comment that this, this part of Jewish history, forced conversion, this is worse than Chorban Beis HaMikdash, which might be another reason why we don't talk about it on B'Av. Because this is a tragedy worse than Chorban Basin. Tisha B'av is related, to, is dedicated to those tragedies that are on par with Chorban Basin. There are certain things that trans are even worse than the destruction of the Basin Mikdash. By the way, there was one of the Spanish Gedalim, Rabbi Avram Zakuto. He wrote a sefer called Sefer Hayochsen. And he also invented the Astrolab. And he had maritime charts. So Christopher Columbus used his maritime charts to uh, navigate and sail to America. Actually, Rabbi Bramzakuto writes that in uh, Portugal, many Jews, they killed themselves to avoid being forcibly converted. And many of these are Jews that we know, we know, we know about. We didn't know that they did this, but, and I'm going to tell you who they were. The wife of the tour, the wife of the Balaturim, she killed herself so as not to be forcibly converted. And the question is, are you allowed to do that? And he brings many rayas that it's um, 
that you are allowed to do that. Gemara and Gitin, where the children jumped off the boat to avoid uh, being violated. And he brings uh, many, many proofs. But this just gives us a picture of what was taking place in, in those times. So there are a lot of things to think about regarding what we don't talk about on Tisha B'Av. So in, in a way, we shouldn't be talking about this today. <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's very painful this information that you're sharing it's uh what, what are we what are what's what what can the <laughs> audience maybe you can leave us with yeah so i want to i want to share regarding the first point you know that we don't cry when we leave the gullus that's something that we we really have to think about that not to be so attached to uh as as comfortable as the gullus is and as much as we're able to practice our Yiddishkeit here in America, but this is not where it's at. This is not our home. This is a, a station, not a destination. Regarding, regarding uh, some of the sad occurrences that we're discussing, you know, it also gives us uh, a moment to pause and think that, yeah, there are things that happen in our time. What happened to... Uh, young men and women in our own time, what families deal with in our own time, when uh, Nebuch, if they're not able to uh, uh, merit to keep their children on the on the path, that difficulty and that challenge, that's worse than Chorban Beis Hamikdash. You know, that's more painful than Chorban Beis Hamikdash. That's something that we ha- we did not experience at the time of the Chorban, and it sort of puts it highlights to us. As wonderful as life is today, but you know, there are families that are dealing with challenges that, you know, go beyond even what we're discussing on on, on Tisha B'av. I want to share with you just one uh, final thing that I learned in Portugal. We were in Lisbon. In Lisbon, we stood in front of a church. Right, you're not supposed to say that I use a church as a landmark. So I'm not going to say which one it was, but there was a uh, there was a monument there. And in 1506, there were terrible pogroms in Lisbon. Let's fast forward 200 years to the year 1755. It was November 1st, what we call All Saints Day. And the whole city was in the church, six or seven different churches. At that moment, an earthquake hit Portugal, the worst, the most severe earthquake in the history of the European continent. It leveled the entire city, 85% of the city. Every church in the city was destroyed. So in this city where they forcibly converted and kidnapped all Jewish children, it was smitten by a supernatural earthquake. Now this earthquake, now what, what do the Christians do when they go to the mass? They light candles. The earthquake caused wildfires. And people were burnt alive in the place that they burnt Yidin there in the auto de fe. And then they were looking for safety. So they ran down to the riverbed. And a tsunami came and washed them away. And whoever survived, the second tsunami came. And then a third tsunami came. So who are we to say why things happen? But... Sometimes, uh, like Rav Miller would always say, Rak sabit rishan tira. You know, sometimes you have to open up your eyes. But I'll tell you, you know, see people see what they want to see. People, uh, so some of the clerics, they said, okay, why is God doing this? It must be, we didn't search out every last converso. There must be some more yidin practicing Judaism in secret. So they found one more yid and they burnt him alive. So on the one hand, you see open Yad Hashem and you see how blinded people could be. And this is all, this is all part of the Galas. Where, look, Chazal tell us Hashem is marich ape, Hashem is patient, but ultimately the gave delay, he, you know, he collects his debt. There's, a, there's a, a day of reckoning. And at the same time, people could be uh, oblivious to it. So it's important for us to to know what we've been through, what we've endured, and use use uh, the rear view window window 
the the rearview mirror as a as a perspective of how to uh, pull out of the driveway and uh, and plot forward. Oh, thank thank you so much. Um, could you leave our audience with Divri Bracha? Obviously, what <laughs> with the Tish above, I know it's hard, but but uh, after Hatzayis, we wait. We, you know, Mashiach, Mashiach is born. And, so it's very um, important, you know, uh, you would think on Tisha B'Av, we're going to spend the whole day sitting in the dirt, sitting in the dust, wallowing in dust. No, Chatzos come, we get up. Because uh, that's the derecha of Kal Yisrael. You got to get off the floor, dust yourself off, brush yourself off, roll up your sleeves, and uh, plot for the future. Look, here we are after 2,000 years, after everything they've done to us, and uh, we're flourishing, we're as strong as ever. So clearly Hashem has been guarding us, watching us. And if you're here today and you're a Zoycha to be able to learn Taira and to be a Shemir Taira Mitzvah, so you have to know that Hashem has been guarding you for 2,000 years from all of these difficulties and all these challenges, be it Chorben, be it Crusade, be it Inquisition. Hashem has been navigating you, saving you, preserving you, so that you could be here today, and he gave you the baton. It's like this has been a long relay uh, race, and now the baton is in our hand, and we're the ones who have to get it to the finish line. That means Hashem trusts us. He trusts you. He's giving you the job that through your learning and your chesed and your tefillah, you're going to take that baton that was passed down to you from your parents, from your grandparents, and it's our job to get, get us to the finish line. Oh, and uh, Hashem is rooting us on. And Be'ezus Hashem, we're going to be Zaycha to, uh, to make it happen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Gladstein, and hopefully we'll meet in person with everybody listening in Shalai and Irak Kedesh. Amen. Today is a very strange day to be Jewish. Um, it's complicated. On one hand, it's a sad day. I mean, that's not complicated. That's okay. It's not fun to be sad. It's sad to be sad, but okay, I can be sad. What's complicated is that at the same time, we don't say Tachnon today because we're told today is a Mayed. A Mayed means a holiday or a festival. Well, Hold on a second. What, what, what's so festive about Tisha B'Av? And the explanation is that, well, right now there's so much grief associated with the tragedies that befell us on this date that that's covering over the inner quality of being a Mayed. But eventually, when Mashiach comes, may it be immediately, um, the grief will be removed, and then what we'll have left over is nothing but celebration. Which is a, like I said, it's that's very complicated. We have one day, which is the saddest day of the year, and at the very same time, it's a potential festival. In fact, it is a festival now. It's just there's too much grief covering it, so we can't connect to the to the joy. You notice know says that Mashiach was born on Tisha B'av. So is Tisha B'Av a day of destruction or is it a day of, of rebirth? And the answer is yes. It's both at the same time. That's what I'm saying. It's complicated. It's very complicated. Now, this sort of complicated situation of being both connected with grief and pain and dysfunction, which that's what exile is. Exile isn't just being banished from our land. Exile is being banished from our true selves. Exile is when we can't be in touch with the neshama and, and its love and awe of Hashem and its fearlessness and its bravery and its serenity and its peace. All of that stuff becomes removed from us. So that's that's what exile means. It means not just being banished from our land. It doesn't just mean a sociopolitical exile. It means a psychological exile as well. And of course, all of this stems from a spiritual exile. 
So on one hand, we're very connected to that. And at the very same time, we're connected to the very opposite, which is the coming redemption, Mashiach, which we're closer to now than ever before in history. I mean, sort of by definition, we're closer to Mashiach now than ever before in history. So we live in a funny time. We live in a funny time where a lot of our lives and our experiences have to do with have to have to do with dealing with the dysfunction of exile but at the very same time we're starting to get in touch with the glory that's coming very soon in 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 Gula. a way to kind of understand this weird time that we live in is uh friday afternoon if you've ever been in any shabbos observant household on friday afternoon you know it's a funny time um, it can be very stressful and, uh, people can, uh, they can behave in ways that they wouldn't normally behave because they feel the pressure time is ticking. And, uh, if you would come into a Jewish house on a Friday afternoon, you might get an impression, wow, this isn't a very happy family. And then you come back a few hours later, Friday night, they're all sitting at the Shabbos table. You say, wow, what an amazing family. They're so bonded. They're so close. They're enjoying each other in <laughs> such peace. And just a few hours earlier, everyone was running around, hectic, stressed. That's the time we're in right now in the cosmic calendar. Every millennium is a day. In the year 5,783, we're, we're in Friday afternoon. So on one hand, we're dealing with the stress of this really unique, confusing time where we're trying to get ready for Shabbos already. It's coming. It's imminent. And there's stress and there's, there's tension. But at the same time, it's like Shabbos is so close, you can already start to taste, it. like literally, you know, it's a mitzvah too. Taste from the Shabbos food before Shabbos, Tayamel. So we're already enjoying <laughs> some of the schnitzel and the maybe we're having some of the cholent and the matzah ball soup. And yet at the same time, it's she was in the shower too long. Tell her to get out. Oh no, can someone run to Costco? We have no seltzer, <laughs> right? So that's that's this generation. That's the era that we live in. <clears throat> confusing time, complicated time. And in this generation, what's happening is we're getting rid of, we're cleaning up the last vestiges of the dysfunction of exile. And we're starting to experience the real peace and serenity of deep healing, of deep return to our essence, to our, to our soul, to who we truly are. And it's all, they're both happening at the same time. They're both happening at the same time. That's what makes this such an interesting time to be alive, where we're dealing with issues that no one ever dealt with before, but we're healing in ways that no one ever healed before. I, I have a group a monthly group that gets together of, uh, I have a men's group and I have a women's group, two separate groups, fathers and mothers who meet separately on Zoom, virtually once a month, who are all alumni of my parenting course. I have a six week online parenting course and many of these people have taken the course more than once. They've taken, some take, have taken it two, three times. And then uh, as a refresher, once a month we get together. And every month we have a different topic related to chinuch, related to parenting. So uh, this month, we had a meeting last week. So this month, I, I figured for Menachemov, Menachemov is about Geula. It's about getting ready for uh, the ultimate healing. But at the same time, like I said, the weirdness of still being in Gaulus and having to deal with the last cleanup that we need to do before we go into the 
redemption. So I spoke about it from a, a, a point of view of, a, of an individual who's, who's, who's trying to heal, and specifically an individual who's a parent and trying to heal. And I said it like this. I said, you know, we've picked up various different defense mechanisms that we've used to cope with the dysfunction of Gullus. Or the people who parented us picked up different defense mechanisms to deal with the dysfunction of Gullus. Or the people who parented the people who parented us picked up various defense mechanisms to deal with the dysfunction of Gullus. And we're carrying that stuff. What do I mean by these defense mechanisms? I mean, you're living in a crazy world. Gullus is so crazy that when Mashiach comes, we'll look back on it and say, it was like a dream. So you're dealing with this craziness called Gullus, and I'm sure you've heard the expression, a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Okay, so the normal reaction to an abnormal situation is that unfortunately we come up with these adaptations, these coping mechanisms, where we convince ourselves that certain things will make us safe. Certain things will, will grant us security. So some of us learn how to be mean and tough. And if, if I'm mean and tough and I can beat everyone up, then I'm safe from this craziness, from this crazy world. Others learn how to be a smooth talker. If I can just convince everyone to calm down, I'll use my words. And if I can just flatter people and talk them into doing what I want, if I become the master manipulator, <laughs> then, then I'm safe, then I'm good, then I can relax. These are the different character defects that we all pick up in childhood or were transmitted to us by parents who picked them up in their childhood or by parents who were who, who had that transmitted to them by parents who had it transmitted to them and so on and so forth. The point is we all, have pick, we all pick up these different character defects, which are essentially the survival mechanism of trying to cope with the craziness of, an, of a world that feels unsafe. Some of us learn how to be invisible. If I can just hide and not get picked out of the crowd, then I'm safe. Others learn to be super driven. Anything that I put my mind to, I can do, no matter who I have to run over. Determination. That becomes their, their coping mechanism. Other people learn to be people pleasers. I have no will, have no desire, no hopes, no dreams, whatever anyone else wants, and I learn how to appease them and give in, and if I can just give everyone else what they want, then I'll be safe. And some of us pick up multiple coping mechanisms. The point is, these are all adaptations to the dysfunction of Gullus. This is what I'm telling the parents at my monthly group last week. And they get passed down from parent to child, parent to child, parent to child. And at some point, somebody's got to be the one to say, I'm not going to carry forward any more of these coping mechanisms. I'm going to drop these defense mechanisms, and I'm going to accept the fact that I don't need anything but Hashem. Yes, this is a lofty, very, very spiritual level, but you know what? What's the alternative? To continue to perpetuate all these neuroses and all these dysfunctions? We have to realize, I thought I needed to be mean and tough, or I thought I needed to be a smooth talker, or I thought I needed to be a people pleaser, or I thought I needed to learn how to be invisible, or whatever it is. And what I realize is, no, I only need Hashem. I only need Hashem. I need a Muna and Betochen and to relax and put myself in Hashem's hands. And that's all I need. And that's all that is authentic to myself. That's what my neshama wants, the real me. And all of the other stuff, those character traits that I picked up, that I became, that I started to identify with, they're not the real me. That's the ego. That's the ego. And that's, the ego is doing what Hashem told it to do. Hashem created the ego to keep us alive. So that's what it thinks it's doing. It thinks it's keeping us alive, which is why <laughs> everything the ego does always feels like life and death. I have to do this because it's life and death. That's the intensity of the ego. <clears throat> it always thinks it's keeping us alive. I have to make more money so I don't die. I have to get another person to approve of me so I don't die. I have to win this argument so I don't die. It's always with the intensity of life and death. But that's the ego. That's not the authentic self.
Those are the gullus adaptations. Again, not the authentic self. So I was saying to these parents, we got to let go of that stuff because we don't want to hand that over to the next generation. I told them something interesting that Lubavitcher Rebbe said. Lubavitcher Rebbe said this is the last generation of gullus and the first generation of Gaula. And I asked, why did the Rebbe call it a generation? A door. And when the Rambam speaks about Mashiach, he calls it Azman. He says, but Isa Hazman in that era, in that time. Why does the Rebbe call it a door, a generation? So I said, I'm not 100% sure about this, but it feels right. You know what it means? The last generation of Gullahs, the first generation of Gula. It means we're the, a generation is literally parents raising children. That's what a generation is. So we're the last parents to raise children with a Gullus paradigm and the first parents to raise children with a Gula paradigm. Gullus paradigm means all of those defense mechanisms that the ego picked up, and it makes sense it picked it up because that's its job. Its job is to protect you. So all those defense mechanisms that I picked up, which become my character flaws, that become embedded in family systems and in family lines, they get handed down generation after generation. We have to be the first generation of parents parenting children to say, I'm not continuing that. And we have to be the first generation of parents to say, I'm going to return to my authentic self, to my neshama. The only thing I need for safety and security in this world is Hashem and my relationship with Hashem. Taira, mitzvahs, amunna, betochen, that's all I need, and I'm okay, and I'm okay. And then from that place of okayness, to raise children who can also feel intrinsically okay, and for whom their relationship with Hashem is what grants them a sense of well-being, not all the gullus adaptations and defense mechanisms. I went as far as to say that the adaptations and defense mechanisms that we've been carrying, either that we developed in our childhood or that our parents developed or our parents' parents or our parents' parents' parents', parents, parents, parents I said, uh, it could really be called a Veda Zoda for two reasons. It's a Veda Zoda because we're relying on those things instead of Hashem, and anything you rely on instead of Hashem is a Veda Zoda. But I said, on a deeper level, it's a Veda Zoda because it is Zod, it is foreign to us. Those defense mechanisms are a betrayal of our true selves. Because if we were more in touch with our neshama, we wouldn't need to do that stuff. We wouldn't feel that, 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 that fight or flight, that, that adrenaline rush, that do or die. And I understand why I picked it up, or my grandfather, or my great-grandfather, or my great-great-grandfather. I understand why under the dysfunctional, crazy situation of Gullus, I understand why we picked it up. But we're the first generation has to say, we're not going to carry it forward. And we have to recognize it as what it is. It's a Veda Zora. It is Zar. It is foreign to us. It's not the real me. That's, and I don't have to hold on to it as a family heirloom just because my great, 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 great grandfather did it. He didn't want to do it. <laughs> He's looking as an Ashama and saying he wished he never picked up that, that maladaption, that, that, that adjustment that he was doing because he, he, that's the best he could do. He, he wants, he doesn't want his great, 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 great grandchildren to, to inherit that he wants me to let it go so i said it's not ours it's not ours this aveda zora it is literally it is our it is foreign to us and we need to let it go and say this is not this doesn't belong to me this doesn't belong to me it crept into this family however many generations ago and now i'm going to be the one to set it down and to say no more it doesn't move on after me I came up with this silly marshal. I don't know why. Sometimes you come up with a marshal because it brings home a point. So I said, imagine a Frum family is Pesach cleaning, out of Pesach. Uh, not just Pesach cleaning, but you know, Bidikas Chomets. So it's, it's the night before Pesach, and they're cleaning for Pesach, and they're checking, searching for Chomets. You know, the feather, the candle, the whole thing. And they look under the couch, and they find it Salem. I just made this up as a silly marshal. I said, what do you want them to do? Oh, no, we found it Salem. And they're trying to figure out, where does this come from? We didn't buy this house from non-Jews. We built this house. No one lived in this house but our family. So it has to be from somebody from this family. What should we do? What should we do? I said it as a marshal about when you become aware of your character defects, what are you supposed to do about it? So I said, one reaction is you take the Salem and you put it on the mantle, put it under glass, shine lights on it, and you make a museum. 
You say, everyone stand around and look at this terrible thing that we found. Look at this dysfunction. Look what we found. It's revolting. And every day you look at it and feel revolted. I said, that's one reaction. Yeah, you could do that. Or the other reaction, put it with the chametz and burn it in the morning. And vaita gegangen, you move on with life. In other words, we're bringing up stuff that previous generations didn't bring up because they were in survival mode. So they didn't deal with these things. We're bringing it up. But once you bring it up, what are you supposed to do with it? Do you identify with it? Do you rehash it? Do you talk about it and re-talk about it? Or do you identify it and say, look, this isn't me. It's not authentic to me. It's an adaptation to this dysfunction called gullus. Either I picked it up or my father, my father's father, my father's 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 father. It doesn't matter when it came in. It's not authentic to us. It's not the neshama. It's a crutch. It's a defense mechanism. The anger, the rage, the fear, the lying, the lust, whatever it is, it's okay. We're going to put it down and leave it. It's, it's, it's not us. We don't want it. We don't want it. We're purging it from our family. And that's it. And then you move on, feeling much lighter. So I, I gave that metaphor. And I don't know why, but I felt like saying it again. I said a second time. A from family is clean for Pesach, night before Pesach. And if I had a Salem under the couch, what should they do? Should they make a museum piece out of it and everyone stand around and be upset about it every day after day after day? Or you put it with the chametz and burn it in the morning. And then I said it a third time. And I don't know why, but I said it a third time. I was feeling it. I said it a third time. And all of a sudden, one of the women on this Zoom, it was the mother's Zoom, she says, Rabbi, stop a second. I got to say something. Yeah, go ahead. She says, I have a Salem. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we all do. We find it and we got to get rid of it. We have to know it's a Veda Zod. She says, no, I have, a, I have a Salem, a real Salem. This is a very, very from woman. I, I know her husband. I know her kids. A very from woman. She says, I have a Salem in my car right now for the past three years. I'm like, whoa, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, let's stop here. What's going on? Talk to me. So she proceeds to tell me a story, her story, her family's story. Her great-grandfather was a Moroccan Jew, a descendant of the Oyer HaChaim HaKadosh. And they left Morocco, they moved to Gibraltar, then from there they moved to Brazil. And in Brazil they lived in the, uh, in the Amazon. There were economic opportunities there, or supposedly. And so her great-grandfather, this Moroccan Jew, a descendant of the Orachayim HaKodesh, is living in Amazon, in Brazil, and his young wife dies, meaning the woman who's talking to me, her great-grandmother dies. They have a daughter, this woman's grandmother, little girl. What are they supposed to do with her? The mother's, the mother's deceased. There's no mother to raise her anymore. In Brazil, the Catholic Church is very strong. They came to this Moroccan Jew, and they convinced him, give your daughter to us. We'll take care of her. And he did it. And he sent her to a Catholic school, and she was raised by nuns. And the nuns used to beat her and berate her and scream at her. When they would make food, they would tell her, get away from the food. Don't touch it with your dirty Jewish hands. That was her upbringing. One night she was home with her father having supper and she took a fork and a knife from the dinner table and she made it into a shape of the image of the Salem that she saw hundreds of times a day in the Catholic school where her own father sent her. And he became enraged. And I would assume also he was full of shame and self-loathing because it was apparent to him Maybe he wasn't conscious of it. Maybe he wouldn't admit to it, but he, I'm sure, hated himself for sending her to that place. So she made the little image of the Salem with her fork and a knife at the dinner table, and he beat her. He beat her. So this poor little Jewish girl, orphaned by her mother at a young age, sent to the Catholic school where the nuns beat her and berate her. And then she comes home, and her father beats her because she's confused. She's just trying to be the way that she thinks she's supposed to be. I mean, this is a gullah story, a pure, sweet, innocent neshama in a crazy, dysfunctional situation. That is gullah. So anyways, eventually this grandmother 
Unfortunately, she she caved to the pressure of the Gullis, and she was baptized. She became a Catholic. She married a Catholic. And she practiced Catholicism her entire life. And she had a daughter, and that daughter was raised as a Catholic and married a Catholic. And that daughter had a daughter. And that daughter was discovered by a shliach of the Lubavitcher Rebbe who told her that she was Jewish. Your mother and your mother's mother is Jewish and she is a descendant of the Orachayim HaKadosh. You're Jewish. And the shliach actually met with the grandmother. And he asked her various questions about her upbringing and she recited different prayers and blessings for him in Hebrew with a real authentic Moroccan accent. And she returned to Yiddishkeit. And she lives in Brooklyn and is raising a very, very wonderful Frum family. When her grandmother passed away, she got rid of the idols. Her grandmother had literal idols. She said statues and stuff, and she used to make clothing for the statues and dress them. It was very, very disturbing stuff. And it was the, this granddaughter got rid of her grandmother's idols when she passed away. Um, but the grandmother was a, a jeweler, a jewelry merchant. She sold jewelry. And the granddaughter, the one who's speaking on the Zoom, she says she inherited a bunch of jewelry from her grandmother, a lot of different pieces. And she said one day she uh, is going through these different pieces of jewelry and she was shocked. She didn't realize it was there. There was at Salem. And one of the pieces of jewelry was at Salem. Now, it wasn't something that her grandmother had ever worshipped. It was just ornamental and there was a difference halachically. But she was horrified. She didn't know what to do with it. She called the Rav three years ago. And the Rav told her it wasn't worshipped, it's just ornamental, you can't keep it, but you're allowed to sell it, and uh, you can even keep the money, but, you know, go take care of it. So she said, this is three years ago, she took the piece of jewelry into her car, and she's about to go to the pawn shop and sell the piece of jewelry, and she, she froze. She said, how can I do this? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a from woman. I'm going to walk into a jewelry store and they're going to see me with this Salem. It's so shameful. She said, no, I can't do it. It's too shameful. She put it in the glove box and she hit it and she said, I'll do it later. She procrastinated. I'll do it later. That was three years ago. She said for three years, she's had that thing in her glove box and she forgets about it because she has, it's just too much shame to deal with. Too much shame. I can't do it. I can't confront it. I don't want to do it. I want to pretend it's not there. And she just keeps it in the glove box. She says from time to time, she, she remembers that it's there and she becomes struck with horror and panic. Oh no, what if my children find it? How confused will my poor little children be? What are they going to think? They're going to find a Salem in mommy's car. What, what will they even do with that information? And then she becomes so guilty, it'll traumatize her children, and then she becomes frozen again. And you could say, well, why? Why is she so frozen? Why doesn't she just get rid of it? Why didn't she just throw it in the, in the ocean? You can ask whatever you want. This is a story that happened last week. And for three years, this devoted, loving mother of a beautiful Jewish family, for three years, she lived with this angst and this anxiety of her grandmother's Salem. Her grandma, her poor little grandmother, the little girl who was orphaned and sent to Catholic school and beaten by the nuns and came home and was beaten by her father and didn't know what to do with all that and became a Catholic. And, and, and this maladaptation, this defense mechanism, this coping that this family picked up to deal with the atrocities of Gullus became passed down. And I told everyone on the Zoom, this is not unique to the person telling this story. This is all of our stories. We all have this Salem. We have this Aveda Zora, this thing that is czar, that is foreign to us, that we picked up or our ancestors picked up, that we, we've been using to cope with the atrocities of Gaulus and to feel safe and, to, and, and secure. And we have to realize that when we finally discover it, when you find that Salem, you have to say, no, it's not mine. The rage, the lust, the fear, the lying, the deceit, the, the people pleasing, whatever the, these maladaptations are, they are not authentic to us. They do not come from our neshama. And we have to say, we're going to be the ones to get rid of it. 
we're the ones who will purge it and clean it. We are the last generation of Gaulus, the first generation of Gaula. We will clean it and not hand it on to our children. So I said to this woman, we got to get rid of this thing. Your, your grandmother needs to be set free. So she called the Rav. The Rav couldn't answer. He was too busy. I called him up. I said, you got to help this woman. We got to set this grandmother's neshama free. He said, I'm dealing with, with, with he says, it's the nine days. It's the air of nine days. I'm dealing with all the questions with, with, with showers and chifa and mikvah. And I, he says, it's the busiest day of the year for me. I said, okay, as soon as you can, please look it up. You have to instruct this woman. At any rate, so he did, and he told her the same thing he told her three years ago. It wasn't actually worshipped, so you don't have to destroy it. Just sell it, get rid of it, do it now. So the next day, she's in front of the pawn shop, and I get a WhatsApp saying, I can't do it. Again, she's freezing. She's freezing. And this is what happens to all of us. When we identify the Aveda Zara, we freeze. We're so horrified by it, we can't part with it. Instead of releasing it, we hold on to it. And then what happens? Just like this woman with the Salem in her, in her glove compartment, we think we've hidden it. But really, we run the risk of our children finding it and thinking we worship it. If you have this character defect, this Aveda Zoro, whatever it is, the rage, the lust, the anger, the, the, the lying, the deceit, the people pleasing, all these, different, all these different adaptations, if you're carrying one of these in your family line, and you try to suppress it and ignore it and pretend it's not there, you keep it hidden in your glove box, all that's going to happen is you run the risk your children eventually will discover that it's there, and they'll think you actually worship it. They'll think it's actually your God. What does it mean, they'll think it's your God? They'll think that that's where you get safety and security from instead of from Hashem. So I told her, you're going in that store right now, you're getting rid of it, because we're going to purify your grandmother. Your pure neshama of your grandmother is still carrying this, this tumma. You're going to be the one to clean it. She needs a tahara. She needs to be cleansed. Okay, fine. She comes out two minutes later from the pawn shop. It's over. She says, you know how much the pawnbroker gave me? 40 bucks. And she says to me, memsa, the units of measure of water in a mikveh. She says, toher. My grandmother's soul is cleansed. I said, you bet she is. Now take the 40 bucks, take it to a real mikvah, and give it, donate it to the mikvah now. And this is what happened last week. <sighs> this is not one person's story. This is all of our stories. Maybe your story isn't that uh, your family comes from Morocco and moved to Brazil. Maybe your family was from Poland or Lithuania or Yemen or Syria or Germany, Tunisia. Maybe they didn't move to Brazil. Maybe they moved to France. Maybe they moved to England. Maybe they moved to America. Maybe they moved to Eretz Israel. We all have different details to our stories. Maybe you're not descended from the Orachayim HaKadosh, but surely you're descended from Avram Yitzchuk V'yankiv, Sara Rivka, Rachel, Valeya. And maybe it's not at Salem. Maybe it's something else. But whatever it is, whatever it is that you're carrying, because the Gullus was so unbelievable, unbelievably difficult for you or your ancestors to deal with, and they picked up some type of defense mechanism that the ego thought would make it safe. And now you identify that character trait and you say, I'm not carrying this forward anymore. I can't be the one to hand this on to my children. Again, you are the last generation of Gaulus and the first generation of Gaula. This is the cleansing generation. Emotional health wasn't really something people discussed in previous generations. You know why? Because they were in survival mode. But now we're in the generation where we have to focus on the deep cleaning and getting rid of anything that's left over, anything that we or our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents or any of our ancestors picked up along the way to cope with a, a, to cope with Gaulus, any of these defense mechanisms, any of these character defects, now is the time to release it. 
And it's as simple as that. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to grapple with it. You don't have to make it your full-time occupation. It is not authentic to you. So just, just release it and invite the gagang in and move. Move on. Move on raising your family with joy and with faith. And one by one, it's happening already. I'm telling you. It's not something that's going to happen. It is happening. Families are healing. Families are cleaning the last remnants of Gullus. It's Friday afternoon. It's Friday afternoon. You can smell the Shabbos food. The Shabbos table is set. Yeah, we're still running around. It's still a little bit hectic. Getting, re- getting ready for the last things that we can do to prepare, but it's also we can feel the peace. The peace is about to set in. We're right. We're almost there. We're almost there. I want to wish each of you who's joining me right now that you should experience personal healing. Your families should experience personal healing. And cumulatively, the entire world should experience the ultimate healing.